I'm E.G. Marshall. Lend me your fears. It happens now and then that a man will vanish without warning, disappear completely without leaving a trace. Or a man will suddenly lose his memory. His body remains, but his mind has gone. What is essential in him leaves us, and we are left perplexed, mystified, frustrated. All we have to go on is rumor, speculation, theory. And since we cannot explain it, after a while, we tend to stop thinking about it. Until it happens again to somebody else. You're back. Oh, my husband, you're back. You won't even embrace me. Who are you? Who am I? What kind of question is that? How can you say you're my wife? We've been married for more than 15 years. No, we haven't. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that I'm not your husband. You're not my wife. I don't even know you. What's more, I'm not even standing here. How can I be? I haven't even been born yet. <laughs> Our mystery drama, A Long Time to Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Alfred Stewart Ainsley. He's 41 years old. Average height, average weight, average looks. Nothing about his appearance to make him memorable. Indeed, he has never in his life done anything to bring him notice from beyond the circle of his immediate family, his close friends, and his rather esoteric profession. His name was in the newspaper twice. First when he was born, and then 30 years later when he was married. However, he is about to make up for it. Right now, his name is on the front pages of newspapers in every country of the civilized world. Alfred Stewart Ainsley, quiet, unassuming, has it in his power to shake the government of the most important country in the world and perhaps alter the very course of history. Alfred, do you want a drink of water? Water? Darling, I know this is difficult, but... Feel okay, Al? No, Jerry, he's not feeling okay. Can't you see there's obviously something wrong with him? Al, what is it? He's pale, he's sweating. Now, look, Al, you're not the one who's being investigated. What have you got to be nervous about? Al, say something. I if you're not feeling well, we can ask for a recess. The chairman's just come in. <clears throat> the committee stands in order. Mr. Ainsley, we will resume with your testimony. I must remind you, Mr. Ainsley, you are still under oath. I would like to continue along a line of questioning initiated by Senator Selby. Would you turn, please, to page 684? Thank you. Heard it out. Question. Is it possible that Congressman Carstairs could have forged the Secretary's handwriting? Answer, Mr. Ainsley... Senator, I would have to examine more examples of both gentlemen's manuscript. Now, Mr. Ainsley, you were given these specimens to analyze overnight, were you not? Or were you not, Mr. Ainsley? Well, you took those samples, you examined them, say yes. Uh, yes. Very well. Now, are you in a better position to answer my question? Well, are you, sir? Al, Al, you told me you had studied them and come to a conclusion. Al, answer Adam's question. Counselor, is Mr. Ainsley having trouble understanding the questions? I uh, know, sir. Mr. Ainsley, it's obvious that something is troubling you. Yes, sir. Well, then suppose we take a recess, give you a chance to rest. Committee will adjourn till 3.45. <laughs> Talk to me. 
I never saw that before. Hmm? Saw what? A man makes smoke. The way you make smoke. Al, are you serious? We have pipes, and we put the tobacco in the pipe, and that's how we smoke. But you're holding something. What's that called? All right. All right. I can play along if that's how you want it. This is called a cigarette. Cigarette? You mean you never heard of it? No. Well, that's odd. Right here, in your pocket. Put your hand inside your shirt pocket. You have a pack of cigarettes. How long do you want to play this game? It isn't a game. Tell me what it is then, Al. You call me Al. I'm not Al. You're not Alfred Ainsley? No. All right, who are you? My name is... Mahatwiki. Yes? In your language, it would be Running Beaver. That sounds like an Indian name. Indian. That word, Indian, yes, yes. In this language, in your language, it would be Indian. You claim you're an Indian? Yes. Well, you don't believe me? Just tell me how you got here. I was sent to the north to scout the, uh, uh, you would call them the Iroquois. Scout? Yes, to see if we should make war. War? Make war or become allies. I was on my way home to my tribe. I was at the place where the mist covers the rocks. I walked into the mist, and there was a noise. What kind of noise? Loud thunder, a flash of lightning. It was as if someone had hit me over the head with a club. I knew nothing. Then I was sitting in a strange room in strange clothes, and strange people were talking to me on a subject I know nothing about. You claim to be an Indian. You talk about fighting and wars. Well, that would be before the white men came to this country. I've never seen men like you and these others. There is one small detail that troubles me. How does it happen you speak English? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I was returning to my people. They live near the banks of the Great River. The Great River? The Potomac. Ah. As I told you, something took place in the mist. I awoke. Now, now I am in a strange place. I find that I can speak the language, but I don't know what anything means. Where is this place? Who are you? I'm your doctor, your friend. My name is Carl Stitzer. And who am I? Al Ainsley. You're a collector of and a dealer in autographs. Historical papers. You're considered one of the top experts on handwriting. I don't know what any of that is. What is it that you know how to do? To track? To scout? To hunt? All right, Al. I've gone along as far as I can. Now let me tell you something. Your testimony can destroy Congressman Carstairs. I don't know anything about this Carstairs. If you testify that, in your opinion, Carstairs forged those papers, then not only will Carstairs be destroyed, but the principles he stands for will be discredited. You believe in what Carstairs stands for, Al. I am not Al. You're torn, Al. You don't want to examine those documents. I don't even know what documents because are. Because if they are forgeries, you will put an end to Congressman Carstairs' political life. And you can't bring yourself to do that. I am a stranger in a strange land. I need a friend. You're afraid to find out if Carstairs is guilty. You can't face the consequences. When a man finds himself in such an intolerable situation, he, he tries to escape. You're a doctor. In my language, that means a medicine man, a magician. You've escaped to a remote past, to a long-gone, buried, forgotten world. You don't believe me. You don't believe me. Doctor, what is it? Think, Joan. Think carefully. How long have you and Al been married? Eleven years. And how long had you known him before that? We were kids in school together back in the first grade. Then you've known him all his life? Just about. Has he ever been interested in Indians? Indians? No, not that I know of. You don't have anything in the house like, oh, handicrafts, weapons, books? That would have to do with Indians? Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. Does Al have a secret life? 
Doctor, I'm not going to answer any more questions until you tell me what you're driving at. Well, see that he gets plenty of rest. No visitors, no excitement. And please keep in constant touch with me. Doctor, can't you tell me anything at all? No. But I do have to ask you one more question. Does he know how to shoot a bow and arrow? Oh, what kind of a question is Just that? Just answer it. I would say no. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we better find out. Morning, Jerry. Doc, I've been waiting for you. Is Al dressed and ready? Now look, Doc, you've just got to talk to me. Why? 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 Don't pretend to be living in a world of your own. You read the papers, you hear the news broadcast. Yes. Al has to testify. Yes or no. Whichever way, it no longer matters. But he can't remain quiet. He's not the only handwriting expert in the world. The committee can call another. It's too late for that now. The rumors are out. He's been bought off. He's been scared off. And both sides are under suspicion. I admit it's an unfortunate situation. Now look, look, Doc. You can maybe stall the committee another day, maybe two, maybe even through the weekend recess. But that is about as far as you can go. I'm doing the best I can. Why can't he testify? I can't tell you. You can't or you won't? Both. Now let me tell you what's going to happen. The committee has the right to assign their own doctors to examine Al. I know. Well, how much time do I have? A week? That's really stretching it. I'm ready to go with you, Doctor. Al, Al, how do you feel? Let's go, Al. Now, why can't I come along? Goodbye, Jerry. A fox has been by here. Is that so? Mm-hmm. You can see his tracks. Well, I can't. This valley looks familiar. And yet, so strange. Where are all the animals? There's no sign of deer or wolf. Where are the animals? If you really are running, Beaver, you wouldn't believe what's happened. Now, in this box is a bow. A bow? Yes. Here's the bow, the strings, the arrows. I've never seen a bow like this one. How strong. And these arrows. Well, I don't know the first thing about it. Is this mine? To keep? To be able to hunt with? Why don't you hit that oak tree? About 60 or 70 yards to the left. Well, that's no shot. The tree is standing still. A child could hit that tree. What's moving? Is there a rabbit or a squirrel, a hawk? No, I'm sorry. There's nothing around. All right, then. I'll put this arrow into the center of the trunk of that small tree on the right. That maple. But that's almost 150 yards. It's an ordinary shot. I'm ashamed of it. But there's nothing else. Right in the center. Well, Doctor? I don't know, Running Beaver. I don't know. How do I explain this? Someone, probably a seasoned politician, said once, when in doubt, tell the truth. That sounds great, in theory. But how would you like to have to tell this kind of truth to a sharp congressional committee? We'll have more of this kind of truth when we return shortly with Act Two. a beautiful stretch of countryside running along the boundaries of Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Hilly, wooded, charming. It's the site of many lovely homes. Some 500 years ago, it was just as hilly, just as charming, much more wooded, wilder, of course, filled with game, and inhabited by Indians. Running Beaver! Running Beaver, it's you! Stop! Huh? You, you're alive. For days, the council has been waiting for you, Running Beaver. The council? You're ill. You've just returned from a long, hard, dangerous journey. But you're the only one who could do it. Now, what what bothers you, Running Beaver? I, uh... I you, you act as if you don't even know me. I'm your friend, your blood brother, Eagle Wing. Come, we must go to the council immediately. <laughs> Uh, 
Many days ago, the council sent running beaver and three companions north to the Iroquois nation to determine peace or war. And now running beaver returns alone and we ask him, where are your companions? And shall the Iroquois be our friend or foe? Speak to us, running beaver. Running beaver, say something. I am very tired. Important questions should not be answered by a man who needs sleep and food. Running Beaver shall return to the council after he has eaten and rested. Sit, my husband. I have meat, corn. I was so frightened, so afraid the Iroquois would kill you. Sit, rest, and, and eat. Now, I will tell you the news about the boy. The boy? Our son. He's been chosen for the Wolf Society. You always wanted that. Your mother brought him this bearskin rope. You're not eating. It's not cooked. It's the way you like it. Is something wrong? You don't look right. Perhaps you'd better see the medicine man. The medicine man? Red Bear. He always liked you. There is something wrong. This is not like you. Not to be hungry. To be so quiet. You're frightened. Why are you frightened? You wouldn't come to me, Running Beaver, so I have come to you. Leave us, White Swallow. Now, what nature of evil spirit is within you? Was there a spell cast upon you in the Iroquois country? I wonder if I can talk to you. You wonder? Your father was my closest friend. I seem to understand. How, I don't know, but I seem to understand this language. Is that a surprise? This is your language. I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how I got here. A spell has been cast upon you. I'm sure you won't believe, but I am not running beaver. How can that be? My name is Alfred. In your language, it would mean a wise elf or wise counsel. Excellent name. I come from, well, perhaps it would be this same land, but, but I live, or shall live, hundreds of years from now. I could tell you stories of, of great things, of great ships flying through the air, of enormous buildings. I, I don't even know where to begin. It must be a time of great magic. Unbelievable magic. What a happy time that must be. I couldn't say that it is all that happy. I find that hard to believe. With all that magic. At any rate, I was going to an important meeting of the committee. Well, never mind what that means. I decided to walk to the bus instead of driving my car. I'll explain to you what they are later. There was a mist near Rockledge. And I walked into it and something... Something seemed to explode in my head. And when I walked out of it, I... I, I was in these clothes. I was somebody else. I was frightened. I began to run. And suddenly someone stopped me. Yes. Eagle Wing, he is your friend. You don't believe a word of this. How can I? You are exactly like Running Beaver. Your body is his, your voice is his. I am not Running Beaver. What am I supposed to say to the council? You will have to appear. The tribe has been waiting for days. The life of every man, woman, and child could depend on what you say. What am I supposed to say? The truth. The truth is what I just told you. Can I say that in front of the council? No. Then what can I do? Now rest, sleep. Sometimes the spirits speak to us in dreams. I'll need more than a dream to get myself out of this. <laughs> Oh, what a dream. 
Joan, you'll never imagine. Oh, no. I'm still asleep. Running beaver. I, I... Can you eat something now? Cool. Oh. Here, wear this robe. Your mother made it. My mother? Please, can't you tell me what's wrong? Running beaver, may I come in? Who's that? Your oldest friend. Do you mean you don't know Eagle Wing's voice anymore? Running beaver. Running beaver, you must come to the council at once. But he's not well. I know, I know he's not well, but there's trouble. Trouble? There, there's talk all over the village. Now, what happened to the three men who went with you to the Iroquois? Did you kill them? Kill them? How could he kill them? They were all his friends. What passed between you and the Iroquois chiefs? Running beaver, you must tell him. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I tell you, all of you gathered here. I don't know. Running Beaver, in war and peace, you've been first among us. We sent you as our ambassador to the Iroquois. We entrusted you with the lives of three of our bravest young men. Now, where are they? Their families have a right to know. Speak. Chief, I will speak for him. No one can speak for a man before the council. Not even you, Red Bear. Running Beaver is ill. What kind of illness? He has lost his memory. That's a mean your loss of memory. Quiet! Where is my son? Where is he gone? I can't see him anymore. Quiet! He has lost his memory? Yes. Can you cure him, Red Bear? I can try. You have six days. At the end of that time, Running Beaver will talk to the council or else... Submit to justice. Why did we come out here? I'm so cold. Where is your knife, Running Beaver? Knife? Running Beaver always carries a knife. Well, I didn't think... Give him your knife, Eagle Wing. Why do I want a knife? Eagle Wing, attack him. Attack? But everyone knows Running Beaver can't be beaten with a knife. Let's make sure. I'll only do it if he keeps his knife in a sheath. Now, you know how excited he gets even when we fight in fun. Attack him, Eagle Wing. Have your knife at the ready, but Running Beaver. Look, are you ready, Running Beaver? Now. Ah! Hi. <laughs> what did you do that for? I... Did, did I catch you off guard? Look, I am trying to tell you people I am not... Eagle Wing, go back to the village. But I... Do as I tell you. I was once. never able to do Go that, back to the village. Him. There is magic yes. here. Yes. Yes, I'm going. I'm going. What did I just see? You saw a man knock me down. You don't know how to fight with a knife anymore. When did I ever know how to fight with a knife? I can't believe it. I was just a quiet kid when I was in school. And I suppose you can't shoot with the bow. No. Or throw the lance. I'm trying to tell you I am not your running beaver. Then we have magic. Call it what you want. But we have trouble. As uh, chief of this council, I call upon Running Beaver to speak. Chief. Chief Star Tracker. I haven't called on you, Red Bear. I called upon Running Beaver. But, Chief. The council has given you six days, Red Bear, six days to cure Running Beaver. Let me talk. Gentlemen, I don't know how to make you understand. Be quiet. No, no, no. Let him talk. But he's mad. Let us judge. I am not who you think I am. I am not running beaver. I told you he was mad. You say you are not running beaver. No, I am not. I don't know how to convince you because I don't even know how it happened myself. White Swallow, step forward. Yes? Is this man your husband? Yes. She really does... Silence! Why do you deny? Are you tired of me? Is there another woman? Oh, good Lord. You could have been living 500 years from now. You women never change. I thought you loved me. All of you, listen to me, please. I know it's hard to believe, but I am not running beaver. Who are you, then? I am a man from a time... I don't know, and it must be hundreds of years from now. Yes, yes. Silence. 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 This is the council. We'll have no disorder here. 
Running Beaver, have you anything more to say? I have plenty more to say, but I don't know how to say it. The council will retire. We shall return with our decision. Red Bear, what are they going to do with me? Well... It's not good, is it? It will depend. Depend on what? Star Tracker is a devout believer in magic. I think he believes you. Well, then it can't be bad. But the people are angry, and three young men are missing. Probably dead. The people feel it's your fault. But... Probably the council will declare that you have been possessed by an evil spirit. It's all nonsense. I'm sure you know what you think. But you asked me what I think. What will happen? The evil spirit will have to be driven out of you. How? Or shouldn't I ask? By fire, by lance, by arrows. You mean they'll kill me? That's how we drive out the evil spirit. Is there anything I can do, Red Bear? I don't know. But I'll try to think. Running Beaver, stand before the council. You have been ordered to report... You refuse. I tried to tell you. Therefore, the council has decided to drive the evil spirit out of you. No! Tell them, Running Beaver, tell them! We must have silence. Tonight, Running Beaver, the council will drive the spirit from you. Wait! He has the right to ask for judgment by combat. What are you saying? Must I remind the council of the law? Very clever, Red Bear. No one dares. Silence! Silence! Well, you've heard the challenge. Who will fight Running Beaver? Your reputation has just saved you. No one will dare to meet you. No one? No one will accept the challenge? Are we a tribe of trembling women? Must I, at my age, save the honor of the people? I'll fight him. Eagle Wing, you, you're his best friend. No longer. After all, he denies he's running beaver, doesn't he? The council accepts the offer of Eagle Wing. May the one who is right win. Clear a space. Wait. The law says each contestant must fast and pray for three days. No, no, Silence. We shall obey the law. We shall meet again in three days. What did you get me into? I got you three days. What good will it do me? You could learn to fight with a knife. Well, you've been a quiet, unassuming handwriting analyst all your life. You've never so much as swatted a fly in anger. Now, suddenly, you have to fight to the death with knives, no less. And uh, how is the other fellow doing? The one who has to face the Congressional Committee. We'll see how it all comes out when we return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. Just as telephone wires can cross when they cover great distance, so can lives when they cover great spans of time. Two such lives have been disrupted. Running Beaver, an Indian who lived 500 years ago, and Alfred Stewart Ainsley, who is a contemporary of ours. Alfred Ainsley is now talking to his lawyer. That is, his lawyer thinks it's Alfred Ainsley. We know it's Running Beaver. Al, level with me. Is this a stall? I keep telling you, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't help it. I talk to the reporters. I talk to the committee people. Nobody understands you. You keep saying you're a friend of Al Ainsley. Yes, Al. We've been friends since college. Then you should know that I am not Al Ainsley. My name is Running Beaver. I'm an Indian. I lived about 500 years ago. I better get Doc Stitzer back here. Jerry, what are you doing here? I ordered complete rest for Al. You know what Al just told me, Doctor? He thinks he's an Indian. It happens to be true. It happens to be... 
Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I think I see. What do you think you see, Jerry? They got to you too, Doc. Who got to me? I don't know. But somebody doesn't want Al to testify. He's been bought off and so have you. Jerry, I resent that. The two of you concocted this ridiculous... It happens to be true. Do you think that you can sell this to Senator Adams, to the committee, to the news media? I only tell you what I perceive as the truth. Oh, they'll skin you alive. What is he saying, Doctor? Something very unpleasant. That's not the worst. You're going to be finished, Dad. Your career will be ruined. You won't have an ounce of credibility left. Jerry, enough for now. No, it's not enough. They'll get you on contempt. They can even pull obstruction of justice, conspiracy. Al, do you realize you can go to jail? Jerry, he doesn't realize anything of the sort. But it should be obvious It to would him. be, if he were Al Ainsley. Doc, are you crazy, Jerry, too? Jerry, this is no time for anyone to lose his head. Okay, 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 okay. Let's be calm. Let's be reasonable. How does a thing like this happen? There's no answer. I've, I've done some research, consulted. And the best I can come up with is... Look, at the speed of light, there's no regular sequence of time. The past, the present, the future, everything is mixed and jumbled up. Everything becomes a storm of pure energy. Doc, what can I do to convince you guys? Sometimes, in rare cases, our thoughts, our ideas achieve such intensity that they, too, become a form of energy and carry our minds into this, this raging storm. And minds can be mixed up and thrown from one body into another. I can't believe I'm sitting here listening to Whatever the reason, he's not Al Ainsley. Now, get a hold of yourself. Jerry, now you can't excite him anymore. I'll throw you out of here. You may not have to throw me out. I want to leave. Now, Al, in exactly three days, you'll have to appear before that committee. If you value your reputation and your freedom, please think up a better story. Or best of all... Tell the truth. Are you awake, Al? I brought you some tea. This is the first chance I've had to talk with you. Darling, what is it? Are you my wife? I mean, his wife. What are you saying? I'm not your husband. Don't say that. It's true. I know you, darling. I've known you all my life. Who knows you better than I do? I am not Al Ainsley. There's someone else, isn't there? Another woman. Please. I knew you were timid, but I didn't think you'd go this far. I have a wife. What? Her name is White Swallow. And we have a son. Al, I don't know what your game is, but you won't get away with it. This visit of yours is most unusual. I know it is, Senator Adams. I have no right to conduct committee business privately. Senator, we just wanted to acquaint you with certain facts. And... And? Well, please just listen. No matter what you hear, just listen. Then use your own judgment. Go ahead, Al. Senator, I am not Alfred Stewart... Ainsley. You're not. I am running bare. I am a Potomac Indian. But this is most unusual. Dr. Stitzer and I, we believe that I lived 500 years ago. Somehow, I have occupied the body of Mr. Ainsley. But though I have his body, I have none of his skills. And? And that's all. And this is what you want me to believe, hmm? It's the truth, Senator. You'll be at the committee hearings on Monday morning. Senator, didn't you hear... Doctor, I don't believe a word of it. It's no use. It's no use. Watch the knife. Watch it constantly. Don't look at your opponent's eyes. Oh, red bear, I'll never learn. You may not be running beaver, but you have his great body, his strength, his agility. I'll tell you what I don't have, his desire to fight. Are you a coward? No, I just don't believe in violence. Strange. I can't kill anybody. The council has already decided, Red Bear. But this will be murder, Chief. He isn't running beaver. 
He does not know how to fight. A man who doesn't know how to fight? Impossible. He is not one of us. He's from another time. Well, how does he happen to be here, then? There is a place, Chief, where the soul that belongs to each man is put into his body. Yes, we know that. It is the sacred, haunted place where the mist meets the rocks. There's always thunder there. Evil, malicious spirits have an opportunity to play tricks. And so... I understand. I even believe... But the council has spoken. He does not know how to fight. He will have to learn. Keep the knife low I, and moving. It's no use. I just can't kill anybody. Even to save your own life? Even to save my own life? Then you are a coward. What's the good of it? Suppose I kill Eagle Wing tomorrow, then what? At least you'll be alive. To do what? To live out my life here in an alien place doing things that I hate? Fighting, hunting, killing? No, I'm better off dead. You'll have to testify before the committee. I can't. You'll be ruined. Well, if that's the only way... Relax. Think. Don't fight against Alfred Ainsley. Accept him. Let his thoughts flow into your brain. Let his knowledge come to you. Why? So you can get past the committee. And then? What do you mean, then? Then what will I do? Live here as Al Ainsley, away from my wife, my son, my friends, my people. Never to hunt, never to fight. To exist in this strange and terrible world, a place I can neither understand nor accept. No. Rather let me be disgraced. Why do you want to be disgraced? So I can die of shame. Wake up, running beaver. Wake up. It's time to start out for the fighting ground. So early... You still refuse to fight him as running beaver would? Yes, I refuse. Why? I told you. I want to die. I know why you would want to die in this life. But I don't understand why you would want to die in your other life. What are you saying? What troubled you? You are a man of trouble. I see that. When you walked into the mist, were you troubled? How did you know? I am only guessing... In your other life, did you also want to die? I'm not sure. Perhaps, perhaps I did want to. Why? Because, because I would have to say something that would, that, no, you couldn't understand. That would have to be something you hate? Yes. Yes, I would have to ruin a man that I had always respected. Did he, does he deserve to be ruined? Yes, because he broke faith. And you did not have the courage to do your duty. I... In other words, you are an even greater coward than I thought. Maybe. Would you rather die under Eagle Wing's knife, or... Or what? Or go back. Do your part as a man. Face your responsibility. Go back? Testify against... Isn't that what must be done? Isn't that what truth and justice demand? Yes. Then you'll go back. But how? How can I go back? Are you sure you want to? Yes. You'll do what's required? Yes. You believe it with all your heart? Yes. Yes, I believe it. Now I believe it. Then come with me. Where? To the place of mist. The sacred place where you became running beaver. Time to be leaving for the committee meeting. I'm ready. I decided to go with you. Let's get it over with. Tell me, something bothers me. It bothered me that first day when I thought that you had willed yourself into amnesia. I can see how Al Ainsley could have found life intolerable. But you're not Al Ainsley. No. Therefore, my diagnosis was wrong. I don't think I understand. Why was life also intolerable for running beaver? Why were you trying to escape as running beaver? To escape? What was tormenting you? How did you know? Did I guess right? Yes. From what were you trying to escape? I had gone with three others to the Iroquois. As an ambassador. 
The Iroquois promised peace. I knew it was a lie. My three friends were bribed. On the way home, they plotted to kill me. I was too smart, too strong. I killed them instead. If I told this to the council, I would make enemies. I was afraid. I see. Would you rather die like a man among your own people, if indeed you must die at all, or would you rather die of shame here among strangers? I am wiser now, but it's too late. It's too late for me. I can't go back. Are you willing to face the council? Face them? Defy them? Fight them? Let's go back to this place where the mist covers the rocks. And when we reach it, try, try to go back. All the way back home again. The committee will stand in order... Mr. Ainsley, are you finally prepared to report your findings? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I've studied all the relevant materials, and I am absolutely convinced. I will stake my professional reputation on the fact that the signature is forged. I say this to the council. Three young men of the tribe took bribes from the enemy. I alone refused. They tried to kill me. I killed them instead. I will answer for this deed with my life. If any man here thinks he can take it. At a certain speed, at a certain intensity, at a certain burning level of anxiety or desire, Time, space, and spirit can be twisted out of shape or sequence. That's how we might explain it today. On the other hand, there are evil and mischievous spirits who delight in creating misery and confusion. That would be yesterday's explanation. Choose one or the other. Or supply your own. I'll be back shortly. What's the moral of our little tale? Simply this. Whenever you're desperate for a means of escape from a problem, don't try too hard for an easy way out. You might just be unlucky enough to find it. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Grace Matthews, Arnold Moss, Nat Poland, and Mason Adams. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Do you hear me, Peor? With this rod, and in the names of Gagarin, Amartin, Algar, and Algasta, I summon thee. It's coming, Arnold. There it is. Over there. I see it. Take the rod and give me the arm. Yes. Stay where you are. I hold the Arthim, whose hilt is signed with the seal of Solomon, and which is more powerful than you are. Now hearken to me. We have a life for you. You will know her as you always have before, because she has your mirror. I give her to you, and thus buy another year of life for me. Is it agreed? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Sit down and try to make yourself comfortable. Yes, it is quite warm in here, but don't worry about it. Because in just a moment, we'll bring you a tale that will chill your blood. A tale of black magic that may have begun centuries ago, but which takes place today. A tale in which one of the dark powers of the pit is released on the campus of a Midwestern university. Did you hear that? It's just the wind. No, it's not. It's something else. I don't hear anything. I do. A kind of humming, singing sound. <gasps> Look over there, near Brewster Hall. It's only a shadow. It's moving. It's coming this way. Oh, now stop it, Debbie. You're getting yourself I all worked up. It's coming this way. Beth, it's got eyes. It's that thing I saw in the mirror. <gasps> Get out of here. Run. Debbie, wait. Oh, don't go that way. This way. Over toward me. mystery drama, The Sending, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Robert Newman and stars Mandel Kramer and Marion Seldes. Is there such a thing as black magic? The ancients thought there was. For centuries, there were those who were willing to trade their souls for the power to call up and control the dark forces of the pit. To what end? Sometimes for power or wealth. Sometimes, as in this tale, to achieve eternal youth, eternal life. But, as we will see, there is always great danger involved. And the price is always high and usually paid in blood. Our spine tingler begins in a large, rambling house on the edge of the campus of a Midwestern university. A gray-haired woman, strangely shrunken, but with intense, gleaming eyes, sits in a chair in a sparsely furnished room, waiting and listening. Arnold? Yes? Where are you? You know where I am, in my room. Hello, Mia. How are you? You know that, too. Where have you been? At a faculty meeting and then at my office. And you couldn't get home before this? Well, I had several conferences. I had to arrange my schedule. That's what you said yesterday. Mia, it always takes a few days when you're starting in a new place. Why are you so impatient? Why? Have you forgotten how I get when my time is running out? Do you realize I've only got about two weeks left? I told you to relax, Mia. Classes will be starting tomorrow, and you know how quickly I can work when I have to. I should have someone for you within a few days. So, to sum up our first session, what we're dealing with, then, is a tradition that goes back to the dawn of time. Man's belief that he can control not the forces of nature, but the forces that shape nature and can give him power over other men, and even over life and death. That will be all for today. You have your reading list and your assignment for next time. However, if any of you are interested in any of the many fields I covered in my outline, by all means, come talk to me, and I'll give you some additional reading for a special report. Well, what do you think, Beth? Well, it was quite a lecture. I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm not talking about the course. I'm talking about him. He's really something, isn't he? Oh, come on, Debbie. He's married, isn't he? Oh, sure he is. All the really attractive ones are. But his wife is about 20 years older than he is. Not only that, but she's not well. How do you know that? Well, I made it my business to find out. Since he just got here, it wasn't easy. But if you really want something... Debbie. <laughs> okay. There's no reason why you should care. You've got someone for yourself. If you're talking about Bill, I haven't got him. 
He just has the room across the hall from me. Which he made a point of getting last spring. So? So? Give me a hand. Come on up and talk to Lansing with me. All right. As a matter of fact, I was going to do it anyway. I thought I might do one of those special reports. Oh, great. Then you talk to him and I'll tag along. Okay. Uh, Professor Lansing? Yes? I'm Beth Howard. I'd like to do one of the special reports you talked about. Oh, I'm delighted, Miss Hahn. It usually takes three or four sessions before anyone volunteers. Was there something you were particularly interested in? Well, yes, the tarot. Mm, I should have known. That's usually one of the first assignments to be requested. Uh, tell me, do you have a set of tarot cards? No, I haven't. Well, after you do your report, I'm sure the bookstore will have to order them. But in the meantime, if you'll stop by my office this afternoon, I'll give you my set and also a supplementary reading list. Oh, thank you, Professor. Not at all. Uh, what about your friend? I'm sorry, I, I don't believe I know your name. Debbie Ross. Would you like to take on one of the special assignments, too, Miss Ross? Oh, well, not right now, Professor, but I'll probably ask for one after the next session or two. But in the meantime, I I wanted to tell you that I, I think the course is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> well, thank you, Miss Ross. Today's lecture was very general, of course, an attempt to indicate approach and sketch in background, but I hope you'll continue to find it interesting. Oh, I'm sure I will. All right, Mia. I told you you could relax, and you can. You've got one? I have several. Two in particular. I'm sure you'll be delighted with either one of them. You're sure? Mia, haven't I done it often enough so that I can tell? Yes, we both have, but Arnold, it'll have to be soon, or I'll be so weak. I won't be able to help. Don't worry, Mia. It will be soon. Not more than another few days. <laughs> power that ever was or will be is here now. Yes? Who is it? Who would you like it to be? Hi. Hi, yourself. So you're into the tarot. How did you know that? I heard you're intoning. Oh, yes. But how did you know that that had anything to do with the tarot? I'm not exactly an ignoramus, but I did a lot of reading in it on my own and in practically everything that was related to it. You never cease to astonish me. Yes, I'm quite an astonishing guy. Uh Uh-huh. But how come you're not just studying it, but working with the cards? It's for Professor Lansing's course. I'm doing a special report for him. Oh, good old witchcraft one, two. Now, come on, Bill. We were a little surprised when we heard he was going to be giving it. No, I don't know why we should have been. Quite a few of the universities are giving courses like it. After all, this is the age of Aquarius. It happens to be a very interesting course. Yeah, sure it is. And Lansing's a fascinating man. Yes, he is. You know him? I've never met him officially, but I've seen him at the pool. The pool? Yeah, he's a very good swimmer. Oh, I'll have to tell that to Debbie. Why? Well, she's taking the course, too. And she's got quite a thing about him. Yeah, well, just tell her to watch your step. Oh, because he's married? No, because I've got a funny feeling about him. Yes, come in. Good afternoon, Professor Lansing. Good afternoon. It's uh, Miss Ross, isn't it? Yes. Oh, I hope this is all right, my coming here to your office. Well, that's what I'm here for. What can I do for you? Well, I told you after your first lecture that one of these days I'd like to do one of your special reports. Yes, I remember. And uh, you're ready to do one now, are you? I've gotten pretty well squared away on all my other courses, so I do have time for it. Well, I'm delighted. Now, is there any area that you're particularly interested in? Uh, No. Oh, well, then how about divination? Foretelling the future? That's right. That's a big field, isn't it? Yes, it is. There must be a hundred ways people have used to look into the future. I'll give you a reading list on it, and uh, why don't I give you this, too? What's that? It's called a speculum. It's an old bronze mirror. What a fascinating-looking thing. Yes, it is, isn't it? I got it in Paris years ago. I've never been able to date it, but it's probably Roman, Mithraic. But what is this strange-looking head on it? That's Kronos, or Eternal Time. He was an important figure in the mysteries of Mithra. And 
And what do I do with it? Well, it was undoubtedly used not just in Roman times, but all through the Middle Ages to foretell the future by looking into a mirror. Oh. Why don't you try it? You'll find the technique described in Zeller, one of the first books on the reading list. Oh, it sounds very exciting. Thank you very much, Professor. Not at all. It's a very rare and unusual thing, so I wouldn't give it to just anyone. But I know you'll take good care of it. And we'll all be looking forward to your report. Mia, I've got the girl. One of the two I told you about. Her name is Debbie Ross. She has the mirror? I just gave it to her. Good. When can we do it? You are impatient, aren't you? Yes. All right. We'll do it tonight. I hope you're approaching the occult with the proper amount of skepticism, said Professor Lansing. But somehow he didn't sound very skeptical himself just now. Exactly what are he and his wife planning to do tonight? And what does that have to do with the mirror he gave Debbie? We'll find out shortly. Unto all things, there is a season. And, of course, the proper time for one of the darkest aspects of the occult black magic is night. Well, it's night now, about ten o'clock. And Beth Howard has just arrived at Debbie's rooming house, which is only a block or so from the campus. I was afraid you weren't coming. Well, you said it was important that you had something to show me. Yes, I have. Look. Oh, wow. What is it? A speculum. What's that? An old bronze mirror, probably Roman. Where did you get it? Ah, from Professor Lansing. Oh. I went to see him this afternoon. Beth, I think he likes me. He said he wouldn't give it to just anyone. Mm, I'm sure he wouldn't. It's a very unusual thing. What are you supposed to do with it? Well, it's all here in this book. The room should be dark, lit only by one candle. And you sit with your back to the candle, and you stare into the mirror... Keeping your mind a blank. Ah, uh-huh. have you done it yet? No. Well, I, I started to, and I, I felt a little funny about it. <laughs> funny how? Just funny. It's a wonderful looking thing, but, but it's pretty weird. You know, all those figures around the edge of it. Mm. Is that why you called me? Yes. I thought maybe you wouldn't mind staying here with me while I tried it. Oh, of course I don't mind. Are you going to do it now? Oh yes. I'll light the candle. Get the light switch. All right. It's strange, but I know how you feel. I felt very much the same way when I was working with the tarot cards. We don't really believe in any of the things we're doing, but for centuries, people did believe in them. Keep quiet. I'm going to look and concentrate. All right. Well, do you see anything? I don't know. I think... Maybe. What do you see? Wait, I'm not sure. It's probably just a shadow, but I... I do think I see something in there. Oh, what does it look like? It's hard to tell. It's dark, very dark and shapeless. It's moving. It's turning. Oh, Beth, it's got eyes. Flaming! Oh, oh, come on now, Debbie. It has. It's looking at me. Put on the light, Beth. I'm not going to look anymore. Okay. Oh. You, you really did think you saw something. Yes. Well, well, as you said, it was probably just a shadow. The, the candle flickering. You really are shook up, aren't you? Yes, I am. You want to come over to my place and stay overnight with me? Well, could I? Of course. Bill's out, too, giving a seminar, but he should be back soon. And, and if my light's on, he'll come in for a while. Oh, good. Just let me get my coat and and wrap this up again. You're taking the mirror? Oh, I better. It may be a scary thing, but it's very valuable, and I said I'd take care of it. All right, Mia. Is it time? 
Yes. Let's go into my study. You'll have to help me. Of course. Take my arm. Oh. Slowly. Arnold, I really am weak. I've never felt so weak before. It doesn't matter. We'll all be over in a little while. Here, now, sit down. Yes. I'll get the box. Here, now, hold it while I light the incense. I have it. Where do you think she is? What is the difference? She has the mirror. No matter where she is, it will find her. Are you ready? Yes. Give me the rod. Here. All right, now you'll be quick with the art theme when I need it. Yes. Here you are. Wherever you are, hear me. Do you hear me, Peor? With this rod, and in the names of Gagarim, Amartit, Algar, and Algasta, I summon thee. It... It... Coming, Arnold. There it is. Over there. I see it. Take the rod and give me the arm, then. Why must it be wrapped this way? You know why. It must be touched until it's needed. Quickly, hurry. Here. Stay where you are. I hold the Arthim, whose hilt is signed with the seal of Solomon, and which is more powerful than you are. Now hearken to me. We have a life for you. You will know her as you always have before, because she has your mirror. I give her to you, and thus buy another year of life for Mia. Is it agreed? Good. Be gone then, and take her. And then fulfill your part of the bargain. It's... 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 Gone. Yes. Are you all right? Yes. Uh... Yes. Somehow I always forget how much it takes out of me. Yeah, here's the Arthim. Wrap it up again carefully. I'll get us both some brandy. Why are you going this way? Well, I thought we'd cut across the campus. Why? You're still upset, aren't you? Yes. Look, I'm not going to say it's silly. I've gotten anxious myself at times when there was no real reason for it. But you know the whole thing was just your imagination. You've been doing a lot of reading about things that are strange, and and you think you saw something in the mirror. Probably one of those heads that are on it. I guess you're right. I'm sure I am. But if it's going to affect you this way, maybe you should give up the course altogether. No, that seems silly. Besides, you always claim one of my troubles was I was too literal, and I didn't have any imagination. Well, it's beginning to look as if I was wrong. (laughs) Well, why don't we talk to Bill about it? It turns out he knows a lot about this sort of thing. How come? Well, he got interested in it through his work in English Lit. The Tarot, when he was writing a paper on the wasteland, and and Black Magic, when he was doing an analysis of the Gothic novels. (laughs) You two are really an item, aren't you? I don't know what you mean. Oh, of course you do. You never see anyone else. Neither does he. Well, I I like him. And he likes me. You just like him? (laughs) Okay. I more than like him. If he asked me to marry him, I'd do it in a minute. He will. How do you know? I just think he will. Well, it's not all that simple. He's just an instructor now, and it'll be a while before he gets (gasps) his... What is it? Don't you hear that? Oh, it, it, it's just the wind. No, it isn't. It's something else. It's... I don't hear anything. Well, I do. A kind of humming, singing sound. <gasps> Look, over there, near Booster Hall. Oh, it's only a shadow. No, it's moving. It's coming this way. No, no, stop it, Debbie. You're getting yourself all worked up about oh, nothing. It's coming this way. <laughs> it's got... Eyes! It's that thing I saw in the mirror! Come on! Run! Debbie, wait! If you're going to run, don't go that way! I'll come this way! Over toward me! Darling, 
her eyes. Mm-hmm. Death. Good, mm-hmm. good girl. I was starting to think I should call a doctor or take you over to the infirmary. What? Oh, Bill. Yes. How are you? Uh, I don't know. I, I, what happened? I'm not sure. I found you lying on the sidewalk at the edge of the campus. I brought you up here to your room. Oh, my head hurts. I'm not surprised. You got a nasty bump. You must have fallen banged it. Now get a wet towel. I'll put on a compress. No, no, wait. Debbie! What happened to Debbie? Debbie? Yes, she was with me. We were going across the campus when suddenly we saw it. The, the thing from the mirror. And, and we started to run and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What thing? I told you, the thing from the mirror. It came after us, after her, and I heard her scream. Oh, Bill, Bill, you've got to go look for her. Yeah, sure, sure. Look, let me let me get that... Contact. No, I'm all right. You've got to go find her. All right, now, quiet down, Beth. Now, when I found you, you were all alone. Because I ran one way toward the house here, and she ran the other, and, and it was after... You don't believe me. Well, it's a little hard when I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, what was this thing that came after you, and and what was the mirror? The mirror that Professor Lansing gave her. She was going to do a report for him on divination, like like the one I'm doing on the tarot. And... All right, now, will, will you hold it a minute? When, when I left you to go to my seminar, you were still here. Uh-huh. You said you were going to stay here and do some reading. Right, and, and then Debbie called and asked me to come to her place, and she said she had something to show me. The mirror? Yes. An old bronze one, a speculum. Speculum, she called it. She was supposed to look into it, describe what she saw. Yeah, specu- uh, speculomancy. That's right. But she felt funny about it, nervous. So she wanted me there while she did it. Yeah, and, and did she do it? Yes. Yes, we, we put out the light and lit a candle, and, and she saw... Well, no, no, she thought she saw something in it, a... A dark shape with flaming eyes, and and that made her more jumpy than ever, so I told her to come back here and stay overnight with me. Mm-hmm. So you started to walk across the campus together. That's right, and there was no one around, and and then we heard something, a, a strange sound. The wind. Oh, that's what I thought, too, at first. But it wasn't. It was a kind of a musical note, and and then we saw it, this dark shape. Did she see it, or did you? We both did. She saw it first, and... Bill, you think I just imagined it? Oh, don't you? I don't know. Well, let's go back over it again. She was tense, nervous, thought she saw something in the mirror, and that made her more nervous. So she decided to come over here with you. Then she saw something, a shadow of some sort, which she identified with the thing she thought she'd seen in the mirror. But I saw it too, Bill. After she described it to you. But I'm sure I did see it. It was, it was huge, dark, and... All right, if I did imagine it, where's Debbie? She's probably back in the room, embarrassed to death at the fuss she made. Well, I suppose that's possible. <laughs> when I think about it, it does sound a little silly. I mean, two grown women getting hysterical. But, you know, would you call her and make sure? Her, her number's in the book next to the phone. Sure. Let's see. Mm, here we are. You know, I think maybe she ought to come over here anyway so that we can talk about this because if the two of you are going to get all worked up about that ridiculous course of Lansing... It's not ridiculous. It's very interesting just because we got a little silly about it. Well? Well, there's no answer. Bill, I I don't like this. I think we should go and look for her. To look where? If she's not in a room and she didn't come up here, she could be anywhere. I mean, with another friend. I don't care. I still want to look for her. I'll show you where it happened, where we started running and... and, well, what, and... what good will that do? Unless she fell and hurt herself also. Look, I'll tell you what. I'll call the campus police and see if they came across her or heard or saw anything. All right. Hello, security. This is William Taylor of the English Department. Uh, This is a rather odd call, but I wonder if any of your men ran into an undergraduate by the name of Debbie Ross within the last hour or so. Well, another student, uh, uh, Beth Howard, was with her. They were walking across campus, and they were frightened by something. No, no, it it wasn't a man. It was... uh... What? Oh, no. Where was... 
was this? I see. All right. I'll come right over. Bill? What is it? One of the guards found her about ten minutes ago. What do you mean, found her? Found her body in the bushes near Brewster Hall. She's dead. Man is a rational animal. And we always look for a rational explanation of anything that puzzles us. But what if there is no rational explanation for it? Do we admit that there may be things we don't know about? Things that we've refused to recognize because the idea terrifies us? Debbie Ross is dead. But how did she die? It's several days later. Many things have happened in that time. There have been questions, investigations, explanations, and recriminations. There has also been a funeral. As far as Beth is concerned, that is the only thing that really mattered. That and what has happened between her and Bill. Yes? Who is it? Bill. Oh. Just a second. Hi. So you're still locking your door? Yes. Which is very silly of me. All right, I didn't say that. It's certainly understandable. Uh Uh-huh. But still pretty childish. You've been treating me as if I were a hysterical female. That's not true. I've been perfectly willing to talk to you about it, but you know what the facts are. Mm, Of course. There were no marks on Debbie's body, at least none that could have killed her. She died of a heart attack. That's right. But they checked back on the physical she took when she was admitted here, and there was nothing wrong with her heart. Look, Bill, we've been through this before. Debbie thought she saw something in the mirror. Thought she saw it again out on that campus, and that made me think I saw it, too. Look, darling. Don't call me darling. Why not? Because I don't want you to. When I first signed up for the course, you teased me about it, even though you've done a lot of reading in that same field yourself. I didn't tease you. Yes, you did, Bill. And you made a few remarks about Lansing, saying you had a funny feeling about him. But now... I don't have a funny feeling about him. As a matter of fact, I feel funnier about him now than ever. Why? Well, because I did a little checking up on him this afternoon. You know, we taught the same course at State last year. Yes, I know. What of it? Well, there was an incident there that was very similar to what happened to Debbie. I mean, a student, a, a member of the swimming team, and, and therefore presumably very healthy, died suddenly one night of a heart attack. One of his students? No. Now, that's the only difference. He, he wasn't one of Lansing's students. Well, then why do you call it similar? And, and why are you making a point of it? it if there was no connection between them, Bill... I, I don't know if there was or not, but I thought perhaps I ought to look into it a little further. How? Well, I'm going to go see Lance. I'm going to talk to him. No, no, Bill. Why not? Because I feel odd about him, too. I, I have ever since Debbie died, and I'm afraid. Yes? Good afternoon. Is Professor Lansing at home? Yes, he is. Do you think I could see him? My name's Taylor, Bill Taylor, and I'm an instructor in the English department. I stopped by his office, but he wasn't there. No, he's been very upset about the death of his student, so he's been working at home. I see. It was an unfortunate thing. Yes, it was. Uh, You're not Mrs. Lansing, are you? Yes, I am. Why? Oh, uh, well, it's, it's just that I thought, uh, I heard... That uh, I wasn't well? Yes, that's right. I wasn't, but I'm fine now. Do you want to come with me? I'm sure Arnold will be glad to talk to you. Thank you. Yes? Arnold, this is Mr. Taylor of the English department here. Oh, come in, Mr. Taylor, come in. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. First of all, I'd, uh... I'd like to tell you how pleased I am that you agreed to stay and continue with your course. Well, I was reluctant to, but the faculty committee felt that I should. 
Now, what happened was very unfortunate, but I don't see how you could have been considered responsible for it in any way. Well, I felt I was. It seems Miss Ross was a very imaginative person, very open to suggestion, which I should have realized. I don't think anyone would have realized it. I, I wonder if you could help me in a project of my own. If I can, I'd be very happy to. What's the project? My doctoral thesis, uh, which is a study of the dark tradition that runs through English literature and led to the Gothic novel. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Very interesting. Well, just how can I help you? Well, I've done a certain amount of reading in the field, but I've wondered if you could give me a copy of the bibliography you used for your course. Well, I'll be glad to. Unfortunately, I don't have any copies here, but I'll send you whatever I have as soon as I get to my office. What's your address? 21 Maple Street. All right. I'll get it off to you tomorrow. I'm very grateful to you. Not at all. Uh, you gave the same course at State last year, didn't you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I did. Uh, did you know Tom Wallace when you were at State? Wallace? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Uh, was he a member of the faculty? No, no, he, he was an undergraduate on the swimming team. He died very suddenly near the end of the term. Oh, yes, yes, I do seem to remember that. Was he a friend of yours? No, no, a friend of a friend. Well, I think I'll be running along, and uh, I do thank you, Professor Lansing. Oh, not at all. Goodbye, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> Did he go? Yes. What did you think of him? He seemed like quite a pleasant young man. And very attractive. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you think so, because he's going to be our next. Oh? Well, you don't have to worry about that for a while. You've got another four months. Yes, I know, but I'm a little concerned about him. As you said, he seemed quite pleasant and very plausible, but... He asked me some rather strange questions. What kind of questions? About where I'd been before I taught at State. Also about your young friend, Tom Wallace. You think he suspects? I don't see how he can. But we can't afford to take any chances. No, I suppose not. I wasn't going to mention it, but he acted rather strangely with me, too. He seemed surprised that I was up and around. Oh? That settles it, then. When are you going to do it? As soon as possible. Beth? Yes, Bill? I've been waiting for you. Do you want to come in here for a minute? I want to show you something. Of course. What is it? This. <gasps> oh, it's the mirror. The mirror Lansing gave Debbie. Uh-huh. That's what I thought. Where did you get it? I found it in my desk drawer about a half an hour ago. Well, how did it get there? Well, obviously somebody put it there. I was out all morning and I, I never locked my door. Professor Lansing? Who else? It's his. And the police must have given it back to him after Debbie died. Well, why would he put it in your desk? That's a very interesting question. I, I think I can answer it, but if I do... You're going to think I've flipped out. No, I won't. Well, you should, because it's completely impossible. Do you know what a sending is? No. When someone who's involved in black magic knows enough and is powerful enough to raise an evil spirit, he can send that spirit to destroy someone. Oh, no. You mean that, that thing that Debbie saw in the mirror that, that I saw out on the campus? Yes. And it's here now? In the mirror? No. But the spirit has to be guided to the victim. And in this case, it's being done with the mirror. It, it will go where the mirror is. I still don't understand, Bill. I, I can understand why he might want to get rid of you, but what did he have against Debbie? He didn't have anything against her, but there was something of hers he wanted. Her life. Her life? Look, you remember what I told you about Mrs. Lansing yesterday? Uh -huh. That while the story was that she was quite old and ill, she turned out to be young and well and attractive? Yes. Well, according to the grimoires, the, the books of black magic, when you raise a spirit, you can also make a bargain with it. Give it the life of someone else in exchange for some more time for yourself or someone close to you. Bill. I told you it was impossible. Well, I, I would have said so, too. A week or so ago, but 
No, I, I don't think so. I think it's true. What are you going to do about it? Well, I've got to get rid of the mirror. Destroy it? No, no, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm going to act as if it were all true, all possible, and fight fire with fire. I'm going to get the mirror back to Lansing. Give it back to him? No. No, put it in his house without his knowing it. Well, how, how, how can you do that? I think I can. He has a class this afternoon. Yeah, but what about his wife? Well, she'll probably go out sometime. If she doesn't, I'll phone her. I'll give her a message that'll get her out of the house. Bill, I'm coming with you. <laughs> Come on in. How did you get in? The back door was open. You sure no one's home? Well, you saw his wife leave a minute ago. Yes. What do you want me to do? Wait here with the door open a crack so you can see out. All right. Well, where are you going? Into his study. You won't belong? I'm frightened. No, 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 no. I'll be back as quick as I can. All right. Go ahead. Nothing. The clock startled me. Will you be much longer? No, no. Come in here a minute. You think it's safe? Yes. What is it? I hid the mirror behind the books on one of the shelves, but while I was here, I thought I'd look in his desk, and I found this box. What is in it? This rod. It's used for raising spirits. And that other thing that that's all wrapped up? Yeah, I was just going to look at it. I think it... Yes. It's an Artheme. What's that? Well, it's a, it's a magic knife that's used to control a spirit once it's been evoked. Uh, this is the seal of Solomon here on the hilt. Then it is all true, at least... Yeah, 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 it looks that way. Bill... You got rid of the mirror, so so let's go. Oh, just a second. I, I want to think. I I don't want him to be able to do anything like this again, but I can't take the whole box. I mean, if I do, he'll know someone was here. On the other hand, I... Yes. I can take the Arthur. Well, won't that do the same thing, Bill? Let him know we were here? No, not right away. See, when I was here yesterday, I saw... Oh, there it is. A dagger. I'll wrap that up and I'll put it in the box instead of the Arthame. Well, what'll happen if he tries to use it? I don't know. All right, Mia. Is it time? We said midnight. You are sure he's there? In his room, now? He has an early class tomorrow, so I would assume so. Now hold the box while I light the incense. Arnold, I don't like this. Why not? We've never done anything like it before. Twice, not just in the same place, but within a few weeks. We have no choice, Mia. He's suspicious. And if he goes on prying, asking questions... Yeah. All right. Give me the rod. Here. Pyor. Wherever you are. Hear me. Do you hear me, Pyro? With this rod and in the names of Dagerum, Amartet, Algar, and Algasna, I summon thee. There it is, Arnold. Over there, near the bookcase. I see it. Give me the Arthim. Here. Stay where you are. I hold the Arthim. I have another life for you. A man this time. He has your mirror. Go to him and destroy him. Why are you looking at me that way? Why aren't you going? I tell you, he has your mirror. Bill, the Arthame is my Persian dagger. What? Quick, find it. If you don't, no. No! Keep away from me! Please! (laughs) 
What time is it now? Quarter after twelve. Do you think he's tried to do anything? I don't know. And I don't know how we'll be able to find out unless... We... Oh, what's, what's that? It's a police car. It's going that way. Toward the Lansing house. But why? Let me see if I can find out. Hello, security. Uh, this is William Taylor on Maple Street. Uh, one of your squad cars just went by going over towards Willow Road. Do you know why? I mean, uh, you know, is there anything wrong? I... Oh. Oh, I see. Thank you. What did they say? They're not sure what's wrong. Someone on Willow Road called and said they heard... terrible screams coming from number 45. As if someone were being murdered. Oh, but, but, but that's... Yes. The... Their house. Oh, Bill, what are you going to do? Are you going to say anything? What would be the point? Do you think anyone would believe it? Of course no one would believe it. Things like that don't happen. At least not today. Oh, people may have thought they were possible once... There are many medieval tales of men who tried to use the powers of evil for their own ends and were finally destroyed by them. As I told you, the tale you just heard was a work of fiction, completely imaginary. But... I am reminded of what Shakespeare said. Why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Marion Seldes, Tony Roberts, and Phoebe Doran. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown, this is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. Just mention the word swamp and cold settles in the bones. The dampness runs through the veins like slime. And the thoughts of the brooding, clawing miasma lingers in the nostrils. Fetid, decaying, conjuring in the mind visions of things that slide and slip and slither in the night. Who's that? Where are you? What is it? Where are you? Stay away! Stay away! I'm trapped! Oh, not in the quicksand. Not in the devil's cauldron. Whoever you are, don't struggle. Try not to move. You'll sink faster. Stay away. The swamp man has me. He'll get you too. It's too late for me. Save yourself. <laughs> Mr. 
mystery drama, The Creature from the Swamp, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jack Grimes and Joan Loring. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A young game and fish warden named Larry Drake, who for reasons of his own lived an isolated hermit's life in the heart of the great swamp, was returning after dark in a wild thunderstorm to his lonely cabin. Just as he approached the cup-shaped body of quicksand and swamp water called... Oh, but uh, since this is his story, and he left a painfully careful and detailed record, why not let him tell it for himself? I'm typing this before I do what I have to do. Because I know the sheriff must be on his way for me by now. This is the end of what began... Seems a lifetime ago. But I reckon it's only a few days. The weather was foul. And as I started to skirt the edge of the devil's cauldron, I heard the sound of a woman crying. I broke through the undergrowth, and in a flash of lightning, I saw her for the first time trapped waist-deep in a slime and sinking fast. Try to stay still! The more you flounder, the more you sink! I'm not in any danger. Now, neither are you if you do as I say. Yeah, grab the end of this tree branch. You steal yourself, too. Let's not fuss over me. Concentrate on you. Grab the branch. That's it. Now, pull it towards you till you get the main stem. All right, now listen. I'm not worth your saving. We'll talk about that later. Now, go on. Grab it. That's just old country talking. Have you got the branch? Yes. Okay. Now, don't you move, you hear me? I'm going to pull you in to me. Don't try to help. You can't do anything without sinking deeper. Just trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Now, hush, hush up, hush up. You're all right. Who are you? Oh, just a guy who pulled you out of the swamp. My name's Larry Drake. Oh, here, I, I brought you some soup. It's so dark in here. It's the middle of the night. Don't you have any light? Just the gas lantern in the other room. Oh. Here, I'll, I'll set this down on the table by the bed. Can't you bring the lantern in here? I'd rather not. You have enough light to see. I want to look at you. Why? I want to see the man who had enough courage to risk his life for me. I don't really think you would. Does it matter all that much? No. Who are you? I told you, Larry Drake. What were you doing by the Devil's Cauldron? Coming home. You live here? Yep. <laughs> if you call it living. Why? I mean, what do you do? Oh, I'm a fish and game warden. You see, right here smack in the middle of the Great Swamp is the last colony of great hooping spoonbills in the world. It's my job to uh, try to keep them living. The blind leading the blind, or uh, the damned trying to preserve the damned. I don't quite understand you. No, I suppose not. See, the Spoonbill and me, we're, we're just the same kind of species. Right out of Mr. Darwin. What does that mean? <laughs> we don't seem to fit our environment. Oh, that makes me sort of the same. Well, now I don't understand you. It doesn't matter. Who, who are you? My name is Udine. That's all? Just Udine? <laughs> I like the way you say it. That's all. Okay. I don't want to pry. Uh, 
What were you doing way out here at the end of the world? I was trying to escape. Run away? If you want to call it that. From whom? The swamp man. The, the who? He lives at the bottom of the devil's cauldron. There are only holes where his eyes ought to be. And his hair is made of Spanish moss. His shoulders are knotted with muscles, and his hands can span a wagon wheel. He has no legs, only a great long trunk with one huge foot like a giant clam that grips the rock at the bottom with a suction no one can break. And he lives on those who are foolish enough to walk the swamp by night. With his hands, he draws them down, down beneath the green slime and shifting black sand. Oh, you've had a bad scare. You need to rest. You should have left me. Now you're lost, too. Oh, what a storm. Devil's out walking tonight. Uh, <laughs> even, Sheriff. Uh, ain't had a spring like this since 53. It... Who's that there stretched out on the tater side? Oh, that mother James and some riffraff friend of his and runs the still with him. Passed out cold. <laughs> but they brung in some powerful tasty corn, like it. Could you use a shot against the cold? <laughs> you wouldn't have to twist my arm, Jeb. I always said you run the best store in Carteret. Well, yeah, the only one. <laughs> yeah, guess you ain't doing much business today, Jeb. No, no, powerful slow. Damn, I meant to tell you right off. Guess who blew in again just before dark? Who? Larry Drake. Larry? Thought you said he'd come in yesterday to stock up for the month. Well, he did. He come back again today all the way from the swamp? He, he did. Well, how come? Well, he wanted some more supplies and uh, uh, a female dress and other such things. What? You think he's finally getting over... Barbara Jane. <laughs> Figure it out for yourself. <laughs> well, how'd he look? Well, that's hard to say. No different, I guess, than he ever will. Well, why didn't he stay in the hospital and have that face fixed? Well, I reckon after what happened, he just plain didn't care. Uh, looks like maybe he might now. You mean old turtle skin Drake's got himself shacked up with some woman? My doggone Bubba, I thought you was cold turkey. <laughs> You only got to mention a woman around old Bubba and he's awake. Now, you lay off, Larry Drake. He's had enough trouble for his lifetime without having to carry you on his back. I'd just like to see what kind of woman old bacon-faced Larry Drake could get to look at him twice. <laughs> you uh, reckon you can sleep now, wouldn't I? You going to leave me, Larry? Bring the lantern. Why? I want to look at you. Very well. Maybe it's best. I'm shading this light. I wouldn't want you to turn away from me. Uncover it. Let me see. All right. Oh, poor Larry. What happened? I had the world in my pocket, Udine. I was going to be married to Barbara Jane, who everybody said would be next Miss America. We were golden boy and golden girl. Wasn't it Byron who said, whom the gods love die young? I got myself all licked up at a party two nights before the wedding and insisted on driving home. We went off the road and into a ditch. I was thrown clear, but she was trapped in the car. I tried to get through the flames to her, but she was burned to a crisp. As you can see, there wasn't much more left of me, except I lived. Your poor, poor face. If they wanted to fix it, I suppose it could have been made better, but I had no money and less interest. I want you to go to the swamp and bring me water from the cauldron. And mud from the edge. What for? I'll show you. I, I don't want to leave you now. I wouldn't let you leave me now. You can only go by daylight. He can only come out of the swamp by night. The swamp man? Yes. 
I'm not afraid of him. I'll go now. No, no, please. Larry, don't. Stay with me. Stay with me. Come, hold me in your arms. What, what, what is it? Are you ill? I'm afraid, Larry. I'm only afraid. He came for me once before. On a night like this, before I was... the dead and the witness because he can't walk he has to crawl like a snake please Larry please hold me hold me hold me oh do you know what it's like to hold a woman again the night the mind can form. What faceless horrors that creep and crawl and drag themselves out of the imagination into the world we think safe. Is the sound Larry and Udine strain to hear some unimaginable creature born from the murky deeps of the rotting swamps? Or does he exist only in the forest of the mind? I'll return shortly with Act Two. An isolated cabin, deep in a semi-tropical swampland. A young man scarred physically and mentally by a tragic accident. A strange girl called only Udine rescued from being sucked to death in smothering quicksand. And outside, a something that bumps and crawls in the rain-swept night. Listen. Let me go. No. If he's there, I'll get rid of him. You can't stand against the swamp man, Larry. I can try. No. No, it's me he's come for. Don't. Don't go out there. Wait. What is it? Listen. Do you hear anything? The rain has stopped. He isn't moving anymore. Damn all, let's settle this. Larry! Larry! It's all right, Udine. There's nobody here. Oh. And the sun is coming up. Oh, he's afraid of light. He can't face the day. Oh. Oh. What, what, what is it, Udine? I don't know. Burning up. Hold me, Larry. Hold me. You want to, don't you? Yes. I don't know why, but yes. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. Is it because I look like her? Who? Barbara Jane. Maybe. No. Y- yes. I-, 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 I don't know. I... I need you so, I need you so. As I need you. As I need you. (laughs) Who who is it? It's Larry. It's all right. I went out to get the mud in the swamp water. Give me water, please. I'll, I'll get some fresh. No. Around the swamp. I have a glass here. Yeah, but, but it's stagnant. It'll poison you. No. No. Like medicine. Give me. Are you, you sure? Please. Okay. Here, Udine. Uh, thank you. Oh, that's better. Oh, I feel much better now. I'm worried about that cough. It's 
nothing. I'm just... I'm very dry. You look so flushed. Bring me the other pail. You did bring mud. It looks more like slime to me. Oh. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. It's marvelous, Larry. You'll see. It soothes the skin. Look. I rub it into my skin. And I can feel the muscles relax. And then become renewed again. It smooths away every wrinkle. Come here, Larry. Kneel beside me. Don't look at me in the light. Don't be afraid. I see behind the mask. And I'm going to gentle that poor charred skin. Feel how smooth and gentle. Shut your eyes. And you are in a cave of water. Down in the cool, green depths. Quiet and soulful. Like a cathedral at the silent bottom of a sunstruck lake. I could have this moment last forever. Or choose it for the one to die. Does it feel good? I don't know about this primeval slime. It, it's all in the touch of your hands. Oh, if only it were. <coughs> Sorry. I'm so tired. Oh, I, sh I should let you rest. No. Here, let me get a cloth to wash your face. No, leave it up. Don't leave. Let me, let me feel your brow. No. Oh, Janae, you're running a fever. I'm going to get it to a doctor. I don't need a doctor. Don't leave me alone. Dearest, what is it you're afraid of? I told you. The swamp man? Yes. But that's plain fancy. Hallucination. <laughs> oh, Janae, who are you? Where do you come from? Are you a husband of... A, a lover of a family? No. No family, no husband. Nobody looking for me but him. I... I have a lover now. Larry. <laughs> I... <laughs> Rest. <laughs> She must be running a hundred or three or four. I've got to get a doctor. A doctor! Tarnation, Larry. You can't just bust in here and ask me to go traipsing off into the swamp with you to look at this girl. But she's sick, Dr. Prince. Very sick. It sounds to me like she could have double pneumonia. I can't, son. There's only one of me. Bring her in here. I'll be glad to examine her. I'd have to carry her out of the swamp. You know there's no road into my cabin. Yes, I know it. It's why I can't spare the time. You think this antibiotic will bring her temperature down? Well, I can only hope. I don't dare prescribe anything else sight unseen. Of course, if I knew for a fact that it was the swamp fever, I... You need a blood test for that. Yeah? All right, Doc. I'll bring you back a blood sample myself. <laughs> That's right. You were fixing to be a veterinarian, I forgot. Yeah, a lot of things I was fixing to be once, Doc. There you are, Larry boy. That'll be 375 out of 10. Now, you take two every four hours. <laughs> you want some water to start off here? Oh, they're not for me, Jeb. Yeah, well, now, I didn't somehow expect they was. You don't act like you were sick, none. No, I'm not. Jeb, I want to buy a gun. Oh, stuff me for a little. I thought you was plumb set against any sort of firearm. Well, I've changed. Uh, how much is that one there? This year, 45? Yeah. And a box of shells. Now, what do you want it for? Protection. Oh, well, I reckon living as deep in the swamp as you do, you need it. All right, that'll be, let's see, $85 and $5.20 and for the state. That's $90.20 altogether. Okay, here is it. Uh, is there enough here? A lie, boy. Where'd you get money like that? Well, I've been saving it since I went into the swamp, Jeb. Uh, nothing much to spend it on there. <laughs> Up until the last few days, huh? <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, come on, son. Now, uh, here, here's a change. I know from the other day that you... Uh, 
You got yourself a woman out there. That's none of your business. Larry, you ain't got nothing but friends around here. I ain't poking into your chicken coop. I just hope she's someone who'll treat you right. And I'm right sorry to hear she's poorly. Well, she got herself caught in the devil's cauldron. I, I had to pull her out. Well, you don't say now. A local girl? I don't know. Any missing hereabouts? Well, not as I've heard tell. Can I... Can I ask her name? Udine. Udine. Yeah, that's a kind of farm, I like, eh? What she look like, Larry? She looks like the spitting image of Barbara Jane. And you found her in the devil's cauldron? Half buried in the quicksand. Larry. Larry, boy, you you sure she's what she seems to be? Hi there, Jeb. Got some smokes for me and my buddy? Well, here's an unexpected pleasure. Mr. Larry Drake, the happy hermit. I'll be leaving, Jeb. Good night. Didn't you hear me talking to you, old buddy? Hello, Bubba. Ain't you gonna say hello to old Jess here? You remember Jess Gilford? Hi, Jess. Oh, there, Larry. Excuse me, I was... What's your hurry? Don't you want to visit for a while? There isn't much left to be said between you and me. That's damn right. Not since you killed my sister. It was an accident. Barbara Jane got killed. You escaped. Come on, Barbara. Let me stay out of this, Jess. What you wearing, Larry? Little black paint to hide that pretty face the fire chewed up? Let me pass, Bubba. Maybe you're smart to cover up now you got a new woman with you. You might turn her stomach. Get out of my way. Blindside of death. three. All three of you. Now, don't any of you move a whisker. Now, you shut up, Bubba, and you just, just stay out of what's none of your affair. And Larry, you don't use your hands for nothing more than letting yourself out that door. Go on now. Well, the going's good. I'm going, Jeb. But why did you tell trash like Bubba about I me? I didn't and... mean to, Larry. He he overheard by accident. Okay. Now, Bubba, you stay away from me. I've taken all from you. I'm going to. Ah, <laughs> shy uh, Larry. Oh, I thought... No, no, there's no, nothing to worry about. Oh. How do you feel? Some water, please. That's oh, right here. Thanks, Larry. Mm. That feels better. I feel like getting up for a while. I, I, I've made us some dinner. If you want me to. Oh, what happened to my dress? I, I threw it away. It was all stained and torn. Oh, well, then what I... I brought you a new one from the store. I... Oh. I hope it fits, and, uh... Oh, I mean, you, you like it. <laughs> you bought me a new gown. Well, you have to have something to wear. Oh. Open this glass. I haven't had a new gown for... Oh, Larry. It's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. Give me a little time by myself to freshen up and put it on. Oh, you're beautiful. <laughs> you're so beautiful. Is it because I look like her? Yes. And no. Barbara Jane is dead. You're alive. What is it? Nothing. Larry, I... <clears throat> Tired again. <laughs> I'm so tired. Oh, I've kept you sitting here too long in front of the fire. You. No. Oh, you sure cast a spell over me. I didn't realize it had gone out. I'll get some fresh wood. No, darling, I don't need a fire. I just need. Is it still raining? Yeah, our cat's and dogs. Oh. So heavy you can't. <gasps> It's dark out. Well, it's been a black day. Night oh. came early. It, so will he. 
This time he won't wait too late. Who can I listen to me, darling? You're here oh. with me. You're safe. There's no such thing as a swamp man. I feel it. He's coming. It's just superstition and folk. No, listen. I should see there's nothing. Listen. Oh! He won't leave without me. He won't leave with you as long as I'm here. No, please, don't go ahead. Now, for us, I'm protected. My son is no use against him. We'll find out soon enough. Swamp Man, if you come for her, you won't get her. <laughs> I'm giving you one last warning. Stay back. <laughs> An eldritch wail, an eerie cry out of the night, and a shot in self-defense. But what good is a gun against a ghoul or a hobgoblin? Creatures of the mind and dark night fantasies are not laid to rest by a bullet. I'll return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. What a host of strange, blood-chilling monsters the human imagination has dredged up from the depths. The Loch Ness Monster, mermaids, sea serpents, the merciless Lorelei, the inexorable sirens, the poet Keats' immortal La Belle Dame Sans Merci, the lovely lady without mercy who lured kings and princes to a watery grave. But in this story, which is the true menace from the swamp. The swamp man himself or his escaped captive, Udine? Let us return to Larry Drake's confession to find out. I didn't mean to shoot, but I couldn't help myself. Then I saw the shadowy figure stumbling towards me. After the shot, the crazy laughing stopped. I moved up on it very carefully. I could see that it was no swamp man since there were legs dressed in jeans and field boots. Uh, Who are you? Baba. Baba James. Oh, God Almighty, Larry, you, you killed me. What were you doing here? It was just, uh, just a joke. Uh, I wanted to see what, what kind of woman would give you the time of day. <laughs> the joke's on me. Kill me just like you killed my, my sister. It was an accident, Bob. I've told you. Oh, uh, you know what, Frogface? You better take yourself out of circu- circulation. You plumb accident prone. Please. <laughs> Where's. Where's Jack? <laughs> Nothing more I could do for Bubba. He was dead. I got a tar from the lean-to by the cabin and covered him up against the rain. And then I went back to the cabin. Udine? What happened out there? Uh, n- n- nothing. Uh, forget about that. All, all that matters right now is to get you to a doctor. No. I'm, I'm too weak, Larry. I, I couldn't make it in this way. Then I'm going for the doctor. No. Don't leave me alone. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay, Udine. With the river cresting and all the rain, I probably couldn't get across anyway. Oh. But tomorrow morning, come hell or high water. Let tomorrow wait for its time. Tonight we're still together. Let time wait on us. I never closed my eyes. But all the time we were together, Udine slept a troubled sleep. Her skin hot and dry, her breathing shallow. I took a pulse and a temperature, and what they showed me sent me off at dawn for town. You know, I don't know what the Sam Hill you're up to, Larry. Have you been drinking? No, Doctor. What do you mean? Well, I don't know about the blood sample. That'll have to be tested. But those other vital signs you described... That's why I'm here to drag you back to see her. Well, it ain't possible. 
A pulse of under 30, a BP of 60 over 40, flushed and feverish and running a temperature of under 90? Well, she should be cold and clammy. That isn't enough to sustain life, human life anyway. You must have made a mistake. No mistake. I was as careful as I could be. Udine is alive. You can see for yourself when you come. Oh, I shouldn't give in to you, but you, you got me intrigued. Can we get across the river? If we leave right now. Okay. Uh, hello? When? Well, can he be moved, Sheriff? Yeah, yeah. Now, look here. You have him lift him in a blanket and handle him like he was partridge eggs. Yeah. Right to the office. I'll be waiting. Well, Larry, I, I can't go with you now. Now, wait a minute. You said you were... Uh, that was the sheriff down to the levee. Toadie William got trapped under a sandbag slide. He's in bad shape. They're bringing him here for me to operate on. How long is that going to take? It could be well on to most of the afternoon. I'll come out to your place as soon as I'm finished. You don't understand. I this understand, is... son, but but I got to take first things first. But you'll surely come. Yeah, I promise. How are you going to find your way into the swamp? I'll pick up Jeb Scanlon to guide me. He knows this country like the back of his hand. <laughs> Sidekick, Bubba. Uh, Bubba, he's dead, Jeff. He's dead. Larry Drake blew a hole in him with a big old forty-five. Lord Almighty! Uh, Does Sheriff know about this? No, no. I just got to town. I thought I might find him here. Oh, he's down the river. Crest goes by this afternoon around four. Uh, uh, yeah, here's your drink. Oh, thank you. When did all this happen? Uh, last night, uh, Bubba and me. Well, you know, Bubba, he, he figured he was going to bother Larry some about the woman he was supposed to be shacked up with. Uh, we come up on the cabin, and the lights was on. And Bubba, he says, I want to give old frog face Larry and his fancy woman some big scare. He just watched me make like old swamp man. And then he started calling, kind of ghostly-like, and... The next thing I knew... Oh, come I, on, boy, pull yourself together. Yeah. Larry come out on the porch and he called out. Then he just let rip with that big old cannon. I heard that slug rip right through, Bubba, and I I took off from the trees like all the devils in hell was on my tail. So you don't know if Bubba's dead. Oh, well, way I heard him take it, I don't see how it could be anything else. You didn't stay to find out? No, sir, not me. You just took out, yeah. Uh. Larry don't know you was with Bubba last night? You no, know, I wouldn't think it. You see, he come out thinking Bubba was the swamp man, and old Bubba, he's just trying to keep up the fun and all that. Yeah, that Bubba was a card. He just picked himself the wrong poker game this time. Sure looks like Larry's got himself mixed up in something mighty strange. <laughs> I'm sorry I was gone so long. Can I get you something? Water from the swamp. No, no more poison. The doctor's coming to see you. The doctor can't help me. Just give him the chance. I haven't time. Listen to me, Larry. He's won. I know that now. Who? The swamp man. I can't live in the air anymore. Ridiculous. That's sheer nonsense. Look at me, Larry. I'm dying. I'm out of my element. Your uh, element? It isn't air anymore. It's water. I have to go back or die. <laughs> if only you could come with me. But he never let you. I'd fight him for you. Oh, I suppose you'd try. You love me that much. 
Larry. Yes, The one we had at dinner last night. Yes. Could you bring a glass and share it with me? Okay, I'll get it. This is no goodbye toast. I'd never let you go. I know. Okay, this is to drink to your staying here till Dr. Prince gets here and has a chance to prescribe for you and make you well. Uh, so that you and me can live forever afterwards. Drink to you, Larry. My love. To you. Uh, oh. Oh. Leave my love till I call for you again. I have to leave you now. The water is green and cool, and it washes the skin like ointment. And the moss dampness makes you whole again. You will be so fair. Your skin renewed. Your youth returned. So much for so little. What is a soul worth after all? <laughs> patient is much more Larry than this mysterious woman. Oh, uh, what's that mean? Well, from all the evidence, no one, save Larry, has seen her. Oh, you, you don't mean she... she don't exist. Well, physiologically, as a doctor, I don't see how she can. In addition to the impossible figures on her vital signs, I got a report on her blood sample. And? I don't know where our veterinarian game warden got it, but... That was no human blood. What kind, then? Mm, not a biologist or a hemopathologist. Reptile, fish. Not a warm-blooded animal and certainly not a primate. You think this is some kind of a hoax? Well, I think a boy I loved very deeply because of what he once was is obviously broken psychologically. I think we'd better get out to that swamp and see what tatters of them remain that might be pasted together. Uh, if Jess Tomlin's testimony is right, there ain't many tatters remaining. So this is the end of it. I don't know what Undy Day put in that wine, but I just woke up and she's gone. I intend to follow her now once I finish this. I don't know what I shall find in the Devil's Cauldron. A fight to the death with a swamp man. Reunion with Udine. Peace at last. Or eternal damnation. I only know that a moment ago I look in the mirror and my face is no longer twisted or scarred. The skin is as young and unwrinkled as it was that night so long ago when Barbara Jane and I left the party two days before we were to be married. I will step into the sand and wait to sink while death smooths me over. Uh, well, maybe there's still time. We better head back for the swamp. Right higher, Jeb. Uh, you ever see anything like that? The old devil's cauldron is boiling like the fires of hell was under it. Probably all the rain in the high surface table. Trapped swamp gas bubbling to the surface. Yeah, or Larry and old one two locked in combat. Oh, they ought to be some way we could get in there and try to help a boy. You stay where you are. This swamp has bought enough lives in its time. Come daylight, we'll see. My God, God. look. What's that? I can't see too good. Hold your lanterns high. Oh. Well, that's a body surface. It ain't Larry. How do you know in his half life? He ain't got no legs. That's a swamp man. Or a manatee or some other animal. Too dark to see. By tomorrow, the currents will have sucked it away. Well, maybe if it is a swamp man, he's the lucky one. Who 
used to say the woman ain't the one who sucks them dry and spews them out. Yeah, you spend too much time gossiping around the stove, Jim. It could be. That's what the old ones say. The swamp is a woman that drags men down, often her body, in exchange for their souls. <laughs> legend goes. But then, there are so many legends. The classic fabled water sprites called Udine, who could receive human souls by marrying a mortal, la belle dame sans merci, who stole men's souls in exchange for love. Their numbers must be legion. And for that matter, since no one but Larry ever saw her, perhaps Udine was only a figment of the imagination. I'll leave you to make your choice. I'll be back shortly. One footnote before we part. The word of this story having gotten around, the Okefenokee Swamp is avoided by hunters these days, like the plague. And as a result, the wildlife, left in peace and quiet, breed happily and prolifically once again. So, like Larry and Udine, let's allow them all to rest in peace. Our cast included Jack Grimes, Joan Loring, Ian Martin, Robert Dryden, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now... A preview of our next tale. Could I talk to you a minute, Mr. Wheeler? Uh, no, Lucas, I'm sorry. I've got to get these groceries home. We have company for dinner tonight. She's at your place, ain't she? A girl. What girl? An Irish Lloyd. A girl who finds things. I'm afraid of her, Mr. Wheeler. I'm afraid she'll find out what we did. Shut up. Don't you ever say anything like that to me again. I'm scared, Mr. Wheeler. I'm telling you, that girl is peculiar. She knows what you're thinking. She knows where you can find anything. Even dead bodies. Get away from me, Lucas. I told you to keep away from me when I came here. Now, get away from my car before I run you down. But I'm scared. I'm scared of that little girl. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of unbridled imagination. You know, man is a curious creature. Most of us settle for routine and habit. Eight hours on the job, another seven or eight in bed, and the other eight on some hobby that is neither too physically demanding nor asks for too many mental gymnastics. Few of us stretch ourselves beyond a reasonable limit. We coast through life. Our metal never really tried. But some of us, through harrowing experience, are stretched to the full capacity of our beings. It's then we find out 
what fiber we are made of. What is it? What is she? Help me! Quick! It's got me! Where's the flashlight? Have it, but I can't see where she is. Eve! Eve! Pulling me on her! We gotta get her! Eve, what is it? The thing! He's pulling me on her! Where is she? Eve! Where is she? Where is she? She's gone! Where? You dragged her under the arch there. Did you see anything? No, but you heard Eve. It's true. There is a thing that lives in these caves. And we're trapped. Trapped here. And it's mercy. Our mystery drama, The Thing in the Cave, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Terry Keene and Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I don't suppose many of us ever plan to grow up to be speleologists since most of us are subject to claustrophobia to at least some degree. For the very few of you who don't recognize the Latin terms, let me add that a speleologist, of course, is someone who studies and explores caves. And claustrophobia is that suffocating, pervasive dread of being shut in. This tale concerns itself with four young spelunkers, Those are cave explorers who do it only for fun. And their gruesome experience of being cave-bound. Literally buried alive. It's just around the next bend in the trailhead. It's funny being born and bred in these mountains, and yet I've never been inside Choctaw Cave. Well, I'm not sure I want to myself. (laughs) You get claustrophobia too, Barbara. David, I never even dare close the door in a phone booth. Darling. (laughs) Yes, Eve? We can forget all this, you know. I don't have to have my childhood revisited. No, thanks. Right on. If I refused you this little memory trip, I'd hear about it for the rest of our marriage. (laughs) (laughs) If you ever decide to go through with the wedding. Oh, just you try to leave me at the altar, David Towers. Well, here we are. (laughs) Are we here? Yes, sir, General Custer. Cavalry is... No. Oh, I don't see any cave. It's right behind that scrub oak there. Listen, what do we do about the horses? Oh, here. I'll hitch us all to the aspen here. My old baldy, all I got to do is let the reins trail. <laughs> he won't budge more than 20 feet till I get back. Hey, you know, it's kind of clouding up over in the northwest. Maybe we ought to be getting back down the mountain. Ah, oh, come on, give you her kicks. <laughs> What's this? Oh, just my old faithful knapsack with some of the remains of lunch. And a flashlight. Ah, uh, meet an old boy scout. Be prepared. I brought a water bottle, too. Hey, come to think of it, if Eve wants to get up to the ledge, which she says goes to the back cavern, we ought to bring along a rope. Uh, fetch my lariat, too, while you're at it. Will do. Where are you fellows? Come on. Bobby and I have found the entrance to the cave. <laughs> When I was a kid. Uh, Barbara and I can make it all mm. right. Crawling, but <laughs> it comes in the giant size. Hank, can you make it? It's just about as tight as a cork in a bottle. <laughs> if I get stuck, you can be sorry if this is the only way in and out. With uh, just a moment, we can all stand up. You'll see. Maybe we should all forget it. You scared? Uh, no, but I'm not exactly happy either. I don't know if Hank can... We're here. In the cave. I can stand up. Oh, come on, everyone. It's just beautiful. It's just as I remembered it. You're right, Eve. It's breathtaking. Like a cathedral buried at the bottom of the sea. Oh, hey. It's all green like Saint-Chapelle in Paris. 
Saint How in Paris? Oh, it's a marvelous chapel near Notre Dame with all stained glass windows that make you feel as if you're scuba diving and looking at it through water. Hey, I could hear water, too. Somewhere. Come on. I'll show you where. Listen, look out for the, uh, what do you call them? Stalactites, if they hang from the roof. Oh, and the ones from the floor are stalagmites, all right? Uh, what makes them, Professor? Uh, my degree's in English, Hank. <laughs> Water dripping, calcium in the rock, something like that. They build up or down, drop by drop over the centuries. Here it is. Here's the waterfall. How about that? Oh, that's beautiful. But where does the pool drain? Well, nobody knows. But some say it's bottomless and it goes right through the earth. Well, where does the river that makes the waterfall come from? Up there? Well, the kids I used to know climbed up to the ledge there and then went in through the cliff. They say it comes from another chamber behind this. Where it comes from before that, I guess nobody knows. What's that? <laughs> Maybe it's him. Him? Talking about. I know, I'm crazy. Oh, but it's such fun to remember how we kids used to come here together and <laughs> talk about the thing. The thing? Well, what was the thing? Oh, it was just something we made up, some country legend someone had heard about this, this creature, this monster that lived in this underground river, whatever it is. What kind of monster? Well, you know. Slimy and slippery and all the blob <laughs> with one great red rimmed eye and long <laughs> snaky tentacles that crept and crawled along the rocks yeah. until suddenly they bounced. What was that? Uh, sounded like thunder. I bet that storm broke outside. Come on. We, we better get going. Oh, just wanted to get into the cave behind this where we are. Just once again. Oh, no, count me out. This place is giving me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, I'm getting a little tight in the throat myself. Come on, darling. You're right, David. I must have been a little crazy. I don't know what it was, but something seemed to draw me here. Almost as if it was something calling. Come on, Eve. Run. Yes. Now, we mustn't lose our heads. It's so dark. It's so pitch dark. What happened to Hank and David? They've gone to see about clearing the entrance. If we only had some light. The boys had the only flashlight. Uh, wait a minute. What is it? Is it the... Is no, it the... No, no, cool it. Cool it, Eve. Just Hank and Dave coming back with the light. Oh, any luck? You both all right? We'll make it. How's Eve? Oh, I'm okay, David. Can we go now? Well, it isn't going to be that easy. Well, can't we help to clear? Eve, uh, Barbara, I, I, I don't know. The, the landslide we heard, it may have covered over the cave entrance outside. You mean that even if people came looking for us, they might not be able to find the entrance to the cave? But that's why we have to start clearing out from inside here. Eve. Well, what is it? I mean, at least we know where the way out is. We can crawl back through the tunnel, Eve, and then we'll... we don't know where the way out is anymore. What do you mean? The whole area where we passed along the stalactites and the stalagmites has collapsed. Even if we could guess where the tunnel going out began, the rocks blocking it are so large, it would take a bulldozer to move them. Oh, good Lord. Then we're trapped. We're sealed in like a tomb. And it's all my fault. Oh, Eve. Eve, all don't. My Come fault. on, darling, baby. Sorry, Kate, Eve. Eve, stop it. Stop it. Take it easy, Barbara. Now, Eve, come on. You've got to get a hold of yourself. Oh, I'm... I'll, I'll be all right. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Hank, have you any ideas what we can do? Well, I, I guess the first thing to do is not to panic. Now, we've got water. I... I've got some chocolate bars and a couple of sandwiches left over from lunch in my saddlebag. We've got light, as long as the batteries last. Which reminds me. 
Do we have to be in the dark? Well, there's no sense in using up the batteries when we don't need it. David. Right here, Eve. Hank, what are our chances of being found? Oh, it's hard to answer, Barbara. Of course, they'll miss us back at the ranch by tonight. Oh, we didn't say where we were going. But when they find the horses hitched right outside... That's we're... always supposing they weren't buried in the landslide. Uh, is there any other way out of the cave you know of, Eve? No, not really. Like I told you, some kids got up on the ledge at the top of the waterfall, and they, they went into some kind of a chamber behind there. But, but they claimed that... That what? Eve, please, we've all got to keep our heads. Well, it, it's just that, that the thing came rising out of the water, hissing and snarling, so they, they just took up and ran. Well, I don't guess four of us grown-ups, as long as we stick together, are going to dream up any boogeyman out of the shadows. I've got to turn the light on for a minute. Twenty after four... They won't miss us till dinner time. By the time they started any kind of search, it'll be dark. Yeah, and with the thunderstorm and the Pakota River running high as it does at the Ford, they may figure we hold up at Halfway House. That's this side of the river? Yes, and there's no phone, right, Hank? That's right. Look, it's it's only about 20 feet up to that ledge. Hmm. It'd be easy to climb. Dave and me could go in through that cleft and have a look around. Maybe there's a way out that way. You girls wait here. Oh, oh, no way. I'm not sitting around in the dark. We'll all go, Hank. Well, okay. You climb first, then. David, right behind you. Then Barb, and I'll come up last. Let's go. Bingo. We're in the second cavern. How big is it? This must be where the waterfall comes from. Is there any way out? Hold it, everyone. Hold it. Let's see. Let's start to the left here. The walls are so smooth, like they've been polished. Once upon a time, I guess the whole floor was underwater. Shine the light higher, Hank, so we can... Let's see. There we... Any clefts or passageways at ground level first. But it's so small. You're over halfway around and nothing. Maybe where the water comes in? <laughs> we'll be there in a minute. Nope. Try along the right-hand wall. The water runs al along against it. And back through a hole in the floor, down to where we came from. Shine the light back again where the water comes in. Why? The batteries are getting dim. thought I saw something. Wait a minute. You may be right. The water doesn't come quite to the top of the archway. It isn't that. It's something else. It's calling me. Wait a minute. Wait. Oh, Hank! Oh. Are you all right? Damn, I turned my ankle. Dave, but the flashlight. No, I know. I'm, I'm looking for it. David! David, help me! What is it? Where are you? Something breaking. Stop it! Where's the damn light? I have it, but I'm pulling me under. Dave, what is it? What is it? Dave! Put it on the floor. Put it under the floor. Dave! under the arch there. I don't know. Eve. I can't swim. I can't look out. Hold the light steady. Toward the arch. I'm going after her. Did you see anything? No. The water's only a couple of inches under the roof. Hank's gone. You see? It's the thing again. And he's coming back for all of us. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord deliver us. The quote is from an old friend, Anon, or to give him his full name, Anonymous. But will he deliver our four young spelunkers, or any of them, from this thing that haunts the cave? I'll return in a moment with Act Two. a creepy, crawly feeling about the very thought of being shut in anywhere without doors or windows. 
Confinement of any kind is as foreign to the human animal as it is to his fellow beasts. And as for caves, I know I wouldn't be found dead in one. Oh, I hope that figure of speech isn't a prophetic one for one of our four young friends who are cave-bound. What was that? Column of water. I, I don't know. But didn't you see something inside it with great arms reaching out like a tree? It was just a geyser, a water spout, some freak of nature. He said there was a thing. Oh, what does it matter? He's gone. She's dead, drowned. And it's my fault. And Hank hasn't come back either. Uh, David, you can't help it if you can't swim. <laughs> hasn't helped Hank that he could. He's disappeared. She was my girl. If anyone had to die with her, it should have been me. Maybe they've gotten to another cave. If they hadn't, their bodies would have come up to the surface. Look at that vortex there, Barbara. Where the spout or whatever it is came from. Just before the archway. It spins like a whirlpool. It could have sucked them both down to the bowels of the earth. Oh, David, what are we going to do? I don't care anymore. Well, I do. Give me that flashlight. It's getting dimmer. Maybe there's a hole or passage higher up that might... What's that? What's that? The light is them. Put it out. No, I can't. I can't. I don't want to be in the dark with them. We'll have them all over us. Ah! Unbrushed against me. Please, please, help me. <laughs> Take it easy, Eve. You're, you're all right. You'll be all right. The thing. The thing pulled me under the water. You're out of the water now. Where? I don't know. Dry land, anyway. Hang Yes. How did you get here? I went into the water. Try to save me? Oh, it's an eagle scout. You know... Trustworthy, loyal, helpful. What about David? He can't swim. Oh, but what did you... How did you... I don't think I could explain. What do you mean? It just doesn't make sense. The stream was flowing out of the arch. So I was swimming against it. But suddenly, something... Something just pulled me along against the current. What about you? Oh, don't you see? It was him. The thing. Oh, if it was, why did he save you and me? You thought he wanted to drown you. Yes, I I did at first, but then... Then it seemed so kind. So kind, as if it wanted to help. But... But Barbara and... David... We've got to find... We've got to get back. Take it easy. Too tired. Oh, yes. Some light so we can... No, nothing but matches. Soaking wet. Maybe dry out. I can't, can't even see the time. Yes, Barbara? Would the light disturb the bats again? They make my flesh crawl, but anything's better than the dark. Well, it must be night outside by now. I, I have a hunch they've taken off for the outside cavern. Why well, are they in for a surprise when they find there's no exit anymore? Maybe they know the one out of here. Let, let's try. So far, so good. It's getting so dim. The roof isn't all that high. Let, let's see. Well... Can you see anything? No. It's like the inside of an egg. Oh, David, what are we going to do? Get back. Get back near the arch. The rock's flat. Maybe if the water goes down or something, we can figure a way... <clears throat> Battery's gone. Oh, no. No, there's got to be light. David, I can't take it. Barbara. I'm joking. Barbara. I'm joking. Hey, hold it. Just wait a minute. <laughs> oh, thank God. Some light. It's only a lighter. It won't last long. Oh. Now we've got to save it. Sit down. Just don't turn it off. I have to. 
Just keep thinking it's there if it's needed. It's there if it's needed. Oh, David, hold me. Please. Okay, okay. you into this. But Eve, Eve, that won't help. What we need oh. to do is move around and try to get warm. Oh, at least we're dry. Yeah. Try those matches again. Oh, no, no good. Well, if only we could see to... What is it? Look up, Eve. Wait, way, way up there. What do you see? It's a shaft of light. Sunlight. That's coming from outside. It means there's a way out. But it's so high up. It's so little. With any luck as the sun rises, it'll give us more light. Then we can explore. How far up to where that light's coming in? Oh, must be a good 60 feet hard to tell in this light. Could we climb up there? Oh, Lord, no. We've got to think about Bob and David first, anyway. Oh, I've been thinking about that. Trouble is, I was groggy when I fetched ashore here. I've no idea how long the underwater swim is. But with the current going with you... Well, there's a good chance I could make it through, but making it back's another problem. Especially since David doesn't swim. <laughs> We can't count on Mr. Thing to be around to help us out again. But here, we have a chance. And there, they don't. So there's got to be some way. I've got a notion. Eve, you got anything to write with? No, I haven't got a pocketbook or any kind of pen. Wait a minute. Pocket of my jeans. Lipstick, any good? Famous. Now look, I'm going to take my canteen and empty it. Now, the one sure thing we have is plenty of water. Yeah. You think we could write a message with lipstick on that? No, not so good in that canvas cover. But if we if we just strip it, we, we could write on the metal. You don't think water would wash it off? I don't suppose you've done much dishwashing. Well, even a bachelor does his share. Well, then you know how tough it is to get lipstick off a glass. I sure do. But how do we get this message? Look. With the stopper in this canteen, it won't sink. Now, I'm going to tie it to the end of the rope and let it float on down far as I can. Supposing the rope isn't long enough. Oh, there's 30 to 35 feet of rope here. It better be long enough. Now, let's put our heads together and figure how much of a message we can get on this canteen. <laughs> Yes, Bob? Is it me? Or is it getting hard to breathe in here? It's all in the mind. You know, it's funny. What? I used to be kind of jealous of all the big brains. Me, I was just, uh, you know, fun and games and the action girl. And no ties, strictly let it all hang out loose. I wish I had the chance to find just... Just one fellow. Oh, David. What, Barbie? You're not kidding me. The air's getting heavier and heavier. Please, can't we have a little light? There's not much light if you... What is it? There's something floating in the stream. Here. Hold this up for me. Uh, can you reach it? Yeah, I have it. What is it? It's, it's a canteen. It's tied to a rope. Looks like Hank's canteen. The water bottle he, he brought in without the cover. Hold it closer. Oh, look. There's writing on it. Oh, God, I'm blind without my glasses. It's in lipstick. <sighs> that means Eve. Here, can you read it? Hold the flame steady. Okay. Eve, Hank, safe oh. hug rope three times if found. Way out. Oh. If writing materials reply, send... All in flask. How much do you measure? About 20 feet. And how far can wait, you... Wait, wait. One, two, three. They've got it. Now all we have to do is wait for one tug, and we can bring back the message. The 
there's so much more we should have told them. Oh, the time. The lighter's almost out of fluid. Thank God my watch has an illuminated dial. If we miss their return instructions, well... Well, we can't, that's all. Hold the lighter. I've got to be sure this bottle's tight to Captain. Okay. Here goes. One tug and... Geronimo. Kill the light. Oh, if I ever get out of here, I'll write for special dispensation during the energy crisis. I never want to spend another moment in the dark again. What does it say? Oh, we could use a better reading light. What's it written on? Pencil on a handkerchief. Dearest Eve Hank, light only for one more message from you. Air supply failing. Trapped here. Give instructions. Expect answer five minutes. Pencil enclosed. Can you imagine? The 20th century, a little less than 20 feet away, and we communicate like the Stone Age. Never mind. At least we communicate. Let's just get them here so we can communicate face to face. It's silly, Dave. You know you can't swim. If anything goes wrong and you panic, I'll at least be here. And if I leave you here in the dark, alone... Uh, now, look, let me slip the rope around your shoulders like Hank instructed. I, I know how to handle a sling like this. Now, will you remember? Yes. Now, go on. Get in and tug. Let's get out of here before my lighter gives out. Oh, it's nothing. I could have swum it alone. I didn't hold my breath more than half a minute. Oh, Bobby, it's so good to see you again. Well, let's get that sling off and float it back on the oh, bottom oh, of David. Yes. Hurry, hurry. You think you'll be able to man? Oh, sure. A cinch. Oh, here you are, Hank. Oh, I just hope your boyfriend isn't jealous. You mean the thing? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I'm uh, 17, 18, 19, 20... 21. It should be right on the mark now. What's the matter? Hasn't he tugged yet? Give him a chance. I hope the lighter hasn't run out of fuel. But if he can't see, then how can he get... Watch the... it. There's the tug. Come on. Let's all pull fast. Should it come as easy as that? Something's wrong. He's lost the rope. Oh. He's lost the oh, rope, no. all right. But it's something worse than that. Get back! Everybody, get back! Once again, some malign influence interferes in the tantalizing possibility of escape for the four young people whose metal has already been tested unbearably. And for the lovers, the tables are bitterly turned. It seems that it is Eve's turn to mourn David. We'll return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Instead of David appearing from the tunnel, secure on the rope, there is an empty sling tied to the canteen for a float. And behind it, a boiling spout of frothing water spewing from the narrow opening of the channel like a huge fire hose, reversing the normal current till the opposing forces drive a seething lake over the floor of the cavern. Hank! Hank, what happened? I don't know. It's that, that thing David and I thought after you went in to save these. David said it was some sort of a, a water spout, a, a, a geyser. Or... Look! What? Floating in. It's, it's David. Uh, help me. Help me. Right with you. Easy. Eve. Uh, let me get him. Don't let him go. It's all right. The water's washing him ashore. Is he? He swallowed a lot of water. Let an R.N. and an old lifeguard handle this one. Get him on his back, Hank. Yeah. That's right. Now, help me pull his jaw forward. Okay. What's that for? Free his tongue so he doesn't strangle. Okay, now let's get the water out of his stomach. And then we'll start mouth to mouth. But what happened, David? Uh, 
lighter gave out, so I had to lie there in the dark, feeling with my hands for the bottle to come through. Except me, I felt it, but it, it, it slipped out of my hands, and I fell in the water, grabbing at the rope. So that must have been the tug I felt. I don't know. I, I lost the rope, and I was floundering when suddenly the water began to literally boil all around me. The water spout. Yeah. It lifted me half out of the water and flung me against the arch. It, I guess it knocked me out. You've got quite a bruise on your forehead. It's what happened to us, Eve. What do you mean? There's some fault right below there. And every often, you know, enough cold water hits the molten lava way down. And well, You're the professor, Dave. What happens? I don't know. I suppose it forms a steam explosion that blows a whole column of water back up into the small cavern in part of the tunnel. It creates... Yeah, sort of a whirlpool that's momentarily strong enough to hit the normal current like a riptide and drive it back. <laughs> Best I can do. I can do better than that. It's the thing that wants to help us. It's saved three of our lives already. Uh, I owe at least part of my thanks to Barbara. And me to Hank. And if it hadn't been for David, I'd have ended up a raving maniac in the dark. I guess we all have turned up a little short one way or another. Except Hank. I'll say one thing. There's only one best man in the group. Only at your wedding, mister. Because, well, Hank is about to exhibit his private white feather. What do you mean, Hank? Well, if we're going forward, there are only two ways to go. Even I have looked at the other end of the river here where it comes in, and there's no way out there. How about the cleft up there where the light comes from? Well, looks to be the best bet, only... Davy, old man, that's 60 or 70 feet up there. And I want to tell you, heights turn my belly to water. Even that first 20-foot climb we made, I'd like to die. I, I didn't dare look down after we got there, so what do we do now? We climb. Just let me look it over. No, it shouldn't be too tough. Are you sure you're up to this, darling? Eva... I may be an egghead, no muscle boy, and I can't swim. But one thing I do know how to do is climb mountains. This one's my baby. Now, just let me go over a few points once again. I lead, he follows, Barb, and then Hank. Oh, what if I fall? You're on a sling. The rest of us can hold you, and if you don't lose your head, try to relax. And as you swing back to the wall, grab hold again. <laughs> but you're not going to fall. Yeah, but... Okay, it isn't a tough climb. The main thing is, don't look down. Uh... Just keep your eyes up. And each one follow whatever toe holds or hand holds the one before is used. I'll test each one of them first. Most of the climb, we can follow ledges. If they feel narrow, face the wall and move sideways. Don't look down and... No hurry. Don't anyone try to play hero. If you're tired, let me know, and we'll rest, okay? I'm not worried, darling. I trust you, Dave. Well, if we don't get started, I may never move. Here we go. Well, we're halfway up now. Anyone want to take a rest? No. I'm all right. Let's just... Keep going. I'm afraid to stop. Next part's going to be a little tougher. Hang in and keep your eyes up. James! James! Hold on, anyone. What is it, Hank? Dave, I can't. I can't. My knee. It's so far Hank, down. I... Hank, damn it. Look up here at me. Now, that's better. Now, you listen. We only have about 15 more feet to go. There's a nice wide ledge we can settle on while I explore the cleft we're heading for. You lose your head, you can take all of us with you. Just cut me loose and let me... Don't be a fool, me. Hank. We're a few feet from getting back in the world. Come on, don't let us all down. All right, I'll try. <laughs> Easy does it, Hank. Just hook your weight forward over the ledge. I can't. I'm stuck. Now, when I pull, get your knee up. There. All right. Now slide yourself back against the rock. Yeah, that's it. Oh. I never get out of this. I'm moving to Kansas, where it's as flat as a pancake. 
What are you doing? I'm tying the rope. I need it. Huh. It was off. But nothing, wasn't it, darling? What do you mean? That place where the light's coming from is behind that big rock in the ceiling. We can't climb up there. It would take a fly. I can get there, darling. How? I just need some knots in this one lariat. Then you see that spur that sticks out? I toss the noose of the lariat over that. And then I can shinny up the rope and over on top of the rock. But you'd swing like a pendulum. If I took off from here without any break. But I'll tie the other rope to this one for a trip line. And the rest of you can let me swing over slowly. And steady me as I climb. But how do we get across there to join you? See that other spur higher up between us and the rock I'm going for? Yes. After I get across, I'll sling a line over that and secure at my end. You can all swing across. Oh. Like we used to do when we were kids and played Tarzan. It's only about ten feet. I don't think I could do it. You've got to, darling. It's the only chance we have left. Oh! Thank heaven! I never thought he'd make it. Did you find the rift? Yes. Does it lead outside? Eventually. It's a sort of long chimney. Could we climb it? Yes, if we were gremlins. It's wide enough all right one way, but the other, it's not over six or seven inches. None of us could get through. Oh, no. Well, that blows it. But what can we do, David? There's nothing to do except climb down again. Not me. I haven't the guts. I don't think I have the strength. You have a mutiny on your hands, Captain. I couldn't make that climb down again either. Okay. We'll do what I told you before. Swing all of you over here. There's plenty of room for all of us. Ah, I got you, Eve. Back on good old terra firma. Just like riding down an elevator. Oh, thanks, Hank. Bye. Oh, so we all got down easy. How does David? He, he's got away. He's sort of takes a hitch around himself, and he lowers himself down. Oh, here he comes. Oh, man, oh, man, that's some kind of guy you're marrying. Everybody all right? We are. A few rope burns, that's all. Sorry I put you through all that for nothing. I wasn't much help, but it was worth a last chance. You have to harp on it. I'm not giving up yet. What else is there to try, darling? Faith. Trust in God. I don't think he'd have put us through all this much and not plan to save us. He certainly tried to see what we were made of. Yes, and look at us. We all came through, and none of us is whimpering anymore or thinking of himself. I still think there's something there. Oh, maybe not a childhood picture of a... a thing. Oh, oh good Lord. What is coming out of that other tunnel? It's hard to see in this murky light. But it's the thing. I knew all along he didn't mean us harm. It's the thing. I reckon I must have thrown quite a scare into you folks. Jim Trimble here, deep sea diving and ocean bed recovery incorporated, ex-frogman in the Navy. You got a mess of folks mighty worried about you on the outside. There's going to be some relief once my boys bring in scuba tanks and gear to get you to the outside there. Just uh, let me give them the go-ahead. Hello, Chris, too. This is Jim. All four missing persons alive and well. Proceed with plan as outlined. But how, how did you find us? Well, sir, my daddy was quite a diver in his day. Free diving, that was. Not with gear like today. And he always had a notion there was a back way into Choctaw Cave through the underground river. And he found it one day off Chiptaw Lake here. And I was about 16. And, well, he went down and he never came back. I wonder if he ever made it to the cave. Oh, no doubt about that, ma'am. After I got out of the Navy, I went down myself with scuba gear and a motor outfit just like now. And I found my daddy, or his skeleton. I figure he got down just holding his breath, but uh, trying to make it up again at that angle, the current was just too strong. And 
after it got him, it brought him back to rest here, you know. I, I brung him out and buried him proper. I'm sorry, Jim. No need. He died doing what he wanted to do. But how did you find us? Well, Hank's old horse, Baldy, was smart enough to outstep that landslide, and when he turned up downhill, folks got alerted, but... Uh, there wasn't a hope of digging you out, and they sent for me, and I got flown in from San Diego, and that's how I come to scare you into thinking I was that old legend I guess my father started <laughs> about the thing. It isn't a legend, Jim. Your father never really died. He was the one that saved us. <laughs> Deep in the Choctaw Caves, the fountains of hot water still spout. The vortexes swirl. The long double lariat still hangs swinging from that high spur. But no living creature will ever enter them again. For even the bats are gone. Smothered in the first two caverns where air forever was shut off. Perhaps all that is left is one thing with a small T now, for it has become the pleasant ghost of a simple, kindly man. I'll be back shortly. So, for this time, a happy ending. And let's write the epitaph to this tale of suspense in Milton's words. Hence, loathed melancholy of Cerebrus and blackest midnight born in Stygian cave forlorn. For myself, I equate cave with a Latin word spelled the same way, C-A-V-E, but pronounced cave. It means beware. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Terry Keene, Michael Wager, Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Then you don't believe in the presence of Satan? No, I don't. All I know is what that kind of talk leads to. Oh, the brick, you mean. I'm sorry about that. Well, yes, you should be. You've got these farmers half insane with your superstitious prattle. Some say that about religion. I wonder why. All right, let's not get sidetracked, Reverend Stokes. I don't want a theological debate. I want you to tell your congregation the truth. And what is that, Dr. Stump? That my son Mike raises frogs for his lab experiments. Shall I tell them to believe in coincidence that a peaceful town is ripped apart every time your son returns? That cattle die for no reason at all? That we are suffering epidemics and the worst drought in our history? All because of coincidence? Yes, yes, you tell them that. This is the 20th century. What else could it be? Ask your son, Dr. Stamper. Ask him if he's just doing lab experiments. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams? G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. It has been said that we are prisoners 
in a dark closet with small openings that on occasion admit some light. Small wonder that the demons who lurk in the deepest corners are more real to us than the sweet light of reason outside. There is so much evil in our world that light turns naturally to shadow. Even the love of Stephen and Amelia Stampler for their son Michael is converted to suspicion in this dark closet we live in. Reverend Stokes, I don't want a theological debate. I want you to tell your congregation the truth. And what is that, Dr. Stabler? That my son Michael conducts his lab experiments for scientific purposes. And shall I ask him to believe in coincidence? What coincidence? That a peaceful town is ripped apart every time your son returns. That cattle die for no reason at all. That we are suffering epidemics and the worst drought in our history. All because of coincidence? Yes. This is the 20th century. What else could it be? Ask your son, Dr. Stampler. Ask your son, Michael, if he's just doing lab experiments. Our mystery drama, A Sacrifice in Blood, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Milt Wissoff and stars Patricia Rowe and Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now it is time to turn to the macabre and nightmare world where there is no shortage of blood. Our tale opens on a pleasant enough note in a fashionable restaurant where Dr. and Mrs. Stampler are celebrating a special occasion. But I promise you, it will end in true gothic horror. Not another drop, Stephen. I've had my fill and so have you. Well, I suppose you're right, my dear, but <laughs> this is really so special. One more dig and the Stamplers hang up their shovels. Well, not really. But we'll be digging up flower beds and compost heaps instead of ancient grave sites. No regrets? None, my dear. We should have retired years ago. Then why not now? I mean, what can this one dig mean? Well, it will be a fitting climax to our career, Amelia. Perhaps the most significant find of our lifetime. Professor Serubius agrees with me. The last excavations there indicate a pre-Toltec civilization existed that was not completely archaic. A highly sophisticated people. Who worship the devil. Oh, why not? Most of us still do. Black masses are held in California. Covens of witches gather in New Mexico. Blood rites take place in the shadows of New York skyscrapers. Oh, nonsense. You've had too much wine. Oh, too much wine. I haven't had enough. Come, Amelia. Let's toast the occasion. To a splendid find. To a safe return. Dr. Estampler? Dr. Estampler? Yes. I am Professor Sarubi. Oh, thank you for meeting us. This is my wife, Amelia. My great pleasure. It's very nice of you. Not at all. Oh, here, uh, let me put your bags in, please. Uh, will you get in? I uh, can't tell you how I've looked forward to meeting you, Professor. Uh, Miguel, if you please. Oh. And uh, I am honored by the opportunity of working with so eminent a scientist. And I would be delighted to have a nice hot bath and about three days of uninterrupted slumber. <laughs> oh, planes are almost as uncomfortable after ten hours of flight as the small donkeys we rode to the Shenandoah site. The Toltecs have always been regarded as the earliest civilization in the Americas. The new finds at Ashtapulco may show one much heavier steel. You really believe it was a civilization? Oh, most certainly. Not by our standards, perhaps. But certainly, in its day, you shall have the opportunity to see for yourselves. We leave at 5 a.m. Monday morning. But that's three days away. Why the delay? Ah, there is much preparation, including the paperwork. You shall get some rest, and I will have the pleasure of acting as your host, if you will permit it. Of course. 
and forgive my impatience. Who's there? It is I, Miguel. Just a second. Uh, forgive me. I know it is late, but it was necessary for me to see you. Oh, that's all right. Come on in. We weren't in bed yet. What is it? I, uh... I am afraid I have bad news for you. We will have to postpone our trip. Why? There is word of trouble in the mountains where the site is. But what kind of trouble? Oh, nothing serious, but it will cause us some delay. Why didn't you tell us sooner? I just learned it, Stephen, when I returned to my room. Well, how long will the delay be? I was... That is hard to say. What kind of trouble is it, Miguel? And... Uh, Indian has been found, murdered. It was, uh, it was a ritual killing. His skin has been removed. Oh, God. Well, we uh, still get back to the basic question, Miguel. How long will we be delayed? Then you're still bent on going? Well, of course, Abeda. A native killing isn't going to stop me. I've encountered worse on other digs. Well, answer me, Miguel. Perhaps you should forget it, Stephen. Oh, come on. Now, both of you, I'm not going to change my plans. If you insist, we will continue. But I must warn you, it will be difficult to assemble a crew. But not impossible. No, no not impossible. If, if we pay enough, there is always someone who will take a risk if the inducement is great enough. I guess you're right, Miguel. See what you can do. Then you'll go along with me? I wouldn't miss it for the world. They're not making much headway, Miguel. Can't they dig any faster? We are up very high, Stephen. More than 10,000 feet. It is not conducive to strenuous exertion. Right. They didn't display too much zeal on the climb, either. But they're not used to the altitude. Why didn't we get men who are? But you know the answer. No one else would come. You haven't seen anyone else since we got up here. They know better. They have broken through to a new chamber. Well, I hope it's more fruitful than the last one. Let's go take a look. Look there. They have an opening wide enough to go through. May I? Of course. This is your excavation, Stephen. Are you are you all right? Yes. Come on in. It's, my God. It's so still in here. Even the echoes die after thousands of years. We seem to be in the anteroom. I imagine the main chamber is just through those doors. It would appear so. Get the men in here. We've got to get those doors open, and it looks like one heck of a job. Siga pronto. No, no. No quiero entrar No, no, no. Siga pronto. No, well, what are they no, waiting no. for? Eh? They will not enter. Well, tell them they'll get docked if they're not in here pronto. It is no use. They will not come. All right, then we'll get the doors open by ourselves. Let's see how thick they are. Throw me a hammer, will you? Pretty solid, big gal. Look! The doors are opening. How? Oh, perhaps Stephen struck some kind of a trigger mechanism by accident. Well, never mind how. It'll save us some sweat, that's all. Stephen, please, be careful. There's something here that makes me... I would go ahead. Not on your life, Miguel. This is one big step I'm going to take. Come on, follow me. Good Lord. It's an enormous chamber. It's like a giant cathedral. Bring the lamps up. That door. It's, it's cut in a single block. Oh, yes. It must weigh at least ten tons. Look at the bar reliefs on the walls. It is the devil that these people worshipped. Beautiful. Sinister, malevolent, but beautiful. Bring the lamps forward. <laughs> what is it, Amelia? The skull! There's piles of British skulls! We have found what we are looking for. The sacrificial chambers of the temple. 
Yes, you're right, Miguel. Can you uh, make out these inscriptions? I see, yes. They tell the story of the ritual. These were incense burners where human hearts smoked. The skulls piled at the base of that enormous slab of stone were sacrificed on that altar. What's that? Oh, Miguel just described it, my dear. The stone slab was the altar. No, I mean in the center of the altar. Probably the debris of centuries. I just saw something stir. <coughs> it's a baby. Oh, completely naked. Oh, that cold stone. Oh, poor child. Oh. No. Yeah, no. Oh, he's lovely. He's so warm. Well, how could he be warm? It's so cold and damp in here. Oh, he must have been left here a few minutes ago. Well, perhaps someone left him as a as a warning to us. Oh, but impossible. There is no other entrance beside the stone doors, not even the windows. This was the sacrificial chamber of these ancient people. Well, then how, Miguel? I don't know. And I'm afraid the answer, if we ever find it, will not be pleasant. Well, at least whoever left him had sense enough to leave some protection. There's a woven mat on the altar. See? And that is one of the mysteries that troubles me. What are you saying, Miguel? The fabric the child is lying on. Examine it. Yes. Yes, I see what you mean. It was woven when the temple was new. When a bright star appears in the east and a child is born, there is a season of celebration. But when a child appears on a sacrificial slab of the temple of an ancient people who worshipped the devil, what will the season bring? Perhaps we shall know more when we return shortly with Act Two. by the philosophy that no one is born evil, that only time and circumstance can corrupt the innocence of an infant. And yet, deep within us, we feel some doubt when monsters arise. What made Cain? Was Adolf Hitler or Jack the Ripper ever a clean slate? Why should we not wonder even stronger when a child appears out of nowhere in the temple of Satan? Well, I am not happy to see you leave, my friends. We'll miss you too, Miguel. Oh, that of course, but I wish you had not decided to adopt the baby and take him with you. I would have preferred you to leave him here with me until I could uh, ascertain what his origins are. I think he's right, Amelia. There's still time to change our mind. Oh, no. No, we fought harder to take him with us than those artifacts from the chamber. I'm not going to give him up now. What difference does it make where our son came from or who left him there? He's a perfectly normal baby, and he means more to me than the trophies we're carrying off. Well, if you have made your minds up, then all I can say is via conduits. I am very delighted that you both have what you wish. Stephen, your find will have an historical impact. Our find, Miguel, would have been impossible without you. And my gratitude for helping us with the baby. We've named your godchild Michael for you. Ah, a great honor, Emil. You'll keep trying to trace his parents? Yes, if that is what you wish. Don't try too hard, Miguel. It doesn't matter where he came from. We're all he needs from now on. I hope you are right, Emilia. Stampler here. Oh, no. I'm sorry. That will have to wait. And look, another thing. Don't set up any more interviews. My wife and I have had it. All right, I'll let you know. Right. <laughs> Don't be so short with Conrad. He's only trying to promote your book. I know he is, Amelia, but we're entitled to some privacy. We've been back home for almost a year now, and I'm sick of interviews and publicity. 
uh, people poking around here. Oh, you know you don't mean that. You're positively glowing with success. No. You proved your theory about the pre-Teltic people, the influence they had on earlier civilizations, and, well, just look at the results. Academic honors and, oh, the fantastic sale of your books on the expedition. This year has been good for you, Steve. Well, of course it has, Amelia, but if we hadn't gone on that bloody trip, we'd have some peace at least. You wouldn't have, Michael. Well, there you're right, my dear. Oh, he's quite a handful for a kid his age. Only a year old. He's been walking for months. And he's such a good-looking child. He's so well-behaved. No, too well-behaved. You know, it's scary. He hardly makes any sounds at all. Oh, count your blessings. Our neighbors envy us so. They want to know how I discipline Michael. <laughs> he's such an angel. Doesn't need any discipline. Well, maybe he doesn't, but I do. I've got to finish my notes for the lecture tour. Are you sure you won't come with me, Amelia? Well, who'd look after Michael? Well, Karen, she's perfectly capable. Oh, nonsense. I mean, he'll be gone in a month. He needs me. So do I. Oh, don't tell me you're jealous. Oh, no, no, no. But I am disturbed. You've got to give a little, and don't try to smother him. It's no good for either of you. Well, I didn't expect you home so soon. It's Michael's birthday, so I thought I'd be early. I was taking a sentimental journey back through the years with Michael's birthday books. Here he is at two. <laughs> yes, I remember. We took him to the zoo and he was fascinated. <laughs> Here he is a year ago. Five years old, growing like a weed. Oh, that reminds me. What can I do to help with the festivities? Oh, nothing. Just relax. Where's Mike? Well, I sent him out to play. On his birthday? I don't understand. What's wrong, Amina? Nothing. The party's off? No one's going to show up? Is that it? Oh, who cares? Well, you do for one. Why aren't they coming? Because we have stuffy neighbors with stuffy children. I just think it's time we moved. Oh, they're all out of step, hmm? That's right. Take their side. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jim, I'm not taking any side. I just want to know... Well, he tears butterflies apart, yanks legs off frogs. Well, he inherited your scientific curiosity. Oh, you know that's impossible. Well, I mean, you, would you set an example for him? Um, level with me, would you? What happened between Michael and the fielding child? Nothing. I, I, I told you. All right, then. You don't mind if I call them and straighten this out? You you, you go ahead and, and call. You'll agree. It. It's the tempest in a teapot. I'd rather hear it from you, Em. Sarah? Is this Stephen? Stephen Stampler? Well, yes, I know. I read your note. Well, can you tell me why? Michael did What? Are you sure? Oh, I see. Yes, I know how you feel. And, uh... Thanks for being direct. Bye. Well? Uh, I just don't understand. Curiosity. It's simple, childish curiosity. Children try to discover the world around them. They, they smell, taste... Heal? They hurt. Well, yes, sometimes they hurt. Not out of malice. Try to be honest, Em. How would you feel if you were Sarah Fielding? I hope I'd have the good sense to take things in stride. Would you? I can't believe it's you, Amelia. You've lost all sense of objectivity. And you've lost all sense of proportion. Are you trying to cast Michael as a, as a monster? I'd like to understand him. But I think I need help. And so does he. Mena? Oh, <laughs> there you are. How are the silver bells? Fine. But the cockle shells are a bit droopy. And so am I. Oh, nonsense. Very gallant, Stephen. But age is beginning to catch up. 
I don't know where the last ten years have disappeared. Seems only yesterday that Michael was six, entering school for the first time. Now he's almost grown. Seventeen. Oh, my, you look handsome today. <laughs> Are you even wearing a tie? Yes, <laughs> so I have. And what's the occasion? We have a friend in town, old Cerulius. Oh, I didn't know he was in his day. Well, neither did I. He's consulting with the museum people, and he'd like to see us. I asked him out to lunch. Ah, oh, that was thoughtful. Now, there's no need to fuss, Amelia. Of course not. I'll get the soil off my hands and throw something together. If Miguel doesn't mind, I certainly don't. Well, thank you, Anne. Is there anything I can get from town for you? No, just hurry back. Cerubius is dying to see Mike. What, 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 what time is Mike due here? Oh, dear, I forgot to tell you. There was a letter from Michael in the morning mail. He's staying at the academy through the holidays. Well, that's odd. Did he say why? Well, he wants to catch up with some schoolwork, and there's an experiment going in the lab. He, well, he just can't leave. Well, that's too bad. Miguel was looking forward to a visit with Mike. He made quite a point of it. This is quite a machine. <laughs> It sounds like my coffee grind. <laughs> it's reliable transportation, Miguel, despite the noise it makes. <laughs> and how is the boy? Well, very well. And so is Amelia. You look fit. I should be. I still clamber over rocks like a mountain goat and dig interminable tunnels. Have you uh, found anything more at the old digs? Enough to verify your findings. But one thing we never discovered. No trace of Mike's parents, eh? No, no. I have shown the pictures you sent me to every man, woman, and child in the region. Nothing. Hmm. Well, how is he getting on? He seems to like it at the academy. As a matter of fact, things are going so well there, he won't be home for the holidays. I'm sorry. Oh, it's too bad. I must see him. You, uh, perhaps I still can. Well, he's not due home until the summer vacation. In that case, Mohammed must go to the mountain. That's quite a trip. <laughs> not to see a godchild. <laughs> well, here we are. We're here at last. Miguel, how nice to see you again. It is always a pleasure, dear Emilia. Oh, you look more enchanting than ever. Oh, thank you. You're so good for my ego. I have drinks set on the terrace. Would you like to unpack first? Ah, uh, no, I think not. A drink would be fine, and then I must be going. But you've just arrived. I prepared lunch. We haven't seen you in years. Too many years. Uh, I know, but I may get a chance to stop in before I go home. What made you change your mind? He's going to visit Mike. Aren't you, old friend? Yes, I think so. Oh, he'll be delighted, as we are disappointed. I hope so. It would be nice to feel wanted by a godchild I have not seen since he was uh, uh, an infant. I'm sure he'd love to see you. He keeps asking about you all the time. You can feel flattered, Miguel. You seem to be the only human being he has any interest in. Yeah, besides you and Emilia. Of course. What's a strange thing to say? Oh, you must forgive me. I have not been in civilized company for ages. My conversation is a little, how do you say it? Uh, rusty? Exactly. <laughs> my bones and my speech are undoubtedly growing rusty. <laughs> that is why I want to see him on this trip. I may never have the opportunity again. I'm just finishing the shelf, dear. Very well. Michael, I don't understand. No hello? Should I go out and start over again? Oh, it's not silly. Hello, darling. Ah, uh, that's more like it. Stephen, it's Michael. Mike! I know. Mother had the same reaction. I just got through sooner than I thought I would. So I rushed home. Put your bags in your room and I'll fix something to eat. You look well, Zed. Oh, why shouldn't I? Leisure is good for the thinking classes. Oh, you look a bit drawn. Are they pushing you? No. 
I'm pushing myself. There's so much to do. What's new? Your godfather paid us a visit. He wanted to see you. Well, here I am. Well, you had to leave. Obviously, he didn't get to see you at the academy. No. I didn't even know he planned to make the trip. Oh, well, that's odd. He said he would go to the academy directly. We must have crossed paths. Oh, excuse me, man. Hello. Yes, this is Dr. Stephen Stamler. Oh, would you mind reading it? What? Would you read that again, please? Oh, my God. What is it, dear? It's a wire from the academy. They found Serubius. Found him? Yes. Miguel is dead. Michael! Michael! Are you home? He's out, Amelia. His car's gone. Strange. He seemed under the weather this morning. Well, he didn't want to attend the funeral. Oh, nonsense. He just wasn't feeling well. You still believe that act after all these years? You know, he's always avoided unpleasantness that way. Well, it was unpleasant, Stephen. An old friend to, to go that way. All right, all right, Em. It's all over. What could have done it? You mean who, Em? No, I don't. Nothing human could have been responsible for Miguel's death. I wonder. You wonder what, Dad? Where did you come from, Michael? You startled me. I was in the garage. My fan belt's loose. I was tightening it. You should have come to the funeral. What for? I never saw Professor Cerubius. He was your godfather. You were his namesake. No, I wasn't feeling so hot anyway. I thought I was coming down with something. How do you feel now? Better, I think. You look healthy enough to me. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. I'll put the tea up, and then it's off to bed with you. She still thinks you're a child, Mike. I know. I want to talk to you, Dad. That's why I came home from school. All right, shoot. I really don't know what I want to do. I think I've had the academy. But you said you liked it there. You're doing well? I know, but I, I can't make the scene there anymore. Too much work? No, not really. I'm just not on to some of the stuff I've got to handle there. The creeps in Fairmount are still living in the 17th century. They'd have witch burning if the law didn't forbid it. Well, what's that got to do with you? Well, some of my experiments have got them on the warpath. I thought you were working in the physical sciences. Well, not exactly. I've been going beyond that. Like what? Well, for one thing, ESP. You've always felt I had it. Well, that's not considered supernatural today. Yeah, I know, but the townies think it is. Well, that's all the fuss I think you should stay on. It never pays to bow down to ignorance. I'm glad you see it that way, Dad. Oh, but there's more, isn't there, huh? What do you know about my people? Where I come from? Not too much. How about Cerubius? Well, he thought he was on to something. He was on his way to talk to you about it. Mm. Too bad we missed each other. Did you? Well, of course. I told you I was on my way back here when I heard... That's not exactly what happened, Mike. He called me from the airport when he landed. What did he say? I don't know. Amelia and I were out. He left a message with our answering service. He said he was going right out to see you. That he had phoned ahead. I never heard from him. And that if anything happened, there was a letter that he was mailing to us. Well, then you did hear from him. By mail, at least. We never received the letter. Did you? Now you're accusing me of tampering with your mail? I'm only asking, Michael. Do you really think I saw Cerubius that night? Did you, Mike? You're as bad as the townspeople. What do you want to hear? A full confession? Oh, okay, I saw the old man. I killed him. Is that enough? Or do you want me to invent the gory details, too? <laughs> Fear can be a force for good or evil. It can keep us from harm, or it can be a malignancy that feeds on darkness and ignorance. 
is Mike a victim of rumor and coincidence, or is he truly evil? We'll find out when we return shortly with Act Three. There is a peculiar kind of fear we call courage that makes us go on when all we want to do is find peace and shelter. It makes men who fear heights climb mountains. Soldiers who detest war and suffering advance on bloody battlefields. Some call it pride rather than courage. Choose now. Retreat now and regret it. Or go on with me to Act Three. Mike, I've just heard from the police. They're still running down leads on the murder of Serubius. But they admit it seems hopeless. Too bad. Did you ever get the letter he said he mailed you? No, I don't know what could have happened. Neither do I. How are you doing in the workshop? I don't know. Thank God frogs are such fast breeders. I kill them off so fast. No results? Only with our neighbors. They seem to connect my frogs with everything bad that's happening. The Gilmore child comes down with meningitis. My frogs are responsible. The, the drought and the unusual heat. The salmonella outbreak. All part of my wicked machinations. How would you like to come out of retirement? Both of you. What do you mean? I'd like to go back to the place you found me. To see if I can trace my origins. Maybe I'll find myself then. Well, I don't know, Mike. I just hadn't thought about it. Well, then don't. Let's just do it. <laughs> it's a gift from our loving neighbors. There's a note attached to it. Let me see that, Mike. This is your last warning. Leave or we will send you back to the hell where you belong. <laughs> They're not all clods after all. Someone has imagination and a gift of expression. This is no laughing matter, Mike. I'm going to find out who's responsible for this outrage. Uh, Dr. Sampler, delighted to see you. I think we can do without the poor maladies, Reverend Stokes. I just want some answers. Yes, so do I. I haven't seen you in church for quite a while. You're very fortunate. I didn't attend last week. I don't think you'd care for my reaction to your sermon. Oh, then you don't believe in the presence of Satan. No, I don't. All I know is what that kind of talk leads to. Oh, the brick, you mean. I'm sorry about that. Well, yes, you should be. You've got these farmers half insane with your superstitious prattle. Some say that about religion. I wonder why. All right, let's not get sidetracked, Reverend Stokes. I don't want a theological debate. I want you to tell your congregation the truth. And what is that, Dr. Stump? That my son Mike raises frogs or his lab experiments. Shall I tell them to believe in coincidence? What coincidence? That a peaceful town is ripped apart every time your son returns. That cattle die for no reason at all. That we are suffering epidemics and the worst drought in our history. All because of coincidence? Yes, yes, you tell them that. This is the 20th century. What else could it be? Ask your son, Dr. Stamper. Ask him if he's just doing lab experiments. I told you, Dad. I'm going back where you found me. With or without you. Mike, that is foolish. Serubius excavated for years but found nothing. What makes you think you care? Because I was born to it and Serubius was not. He was contaminated by Spanish blood. My lines are pure. I need to find my way to another world. Will you come with me? You're not serious, Mike. I've got to go, Mother. I thought you'd understand. Well, I do. I, I just want you to think things through a little longer. Go back to school. Just finish this semester and then we'll all go back. I promise you. That makes sense, Mike. It's only a few months. What do you say? Okay, but I won't let you stall me past then. I think my word is good enough. It is, Dad. Then, that's settled. Now, why don't you take Dad out for a walk? This room needs cleaning and airing. Are you implying? Not at all. I'm uh, stating it quite clearly. Either I clean this place now, or I'll send in some goats to keep you company tonight. Now, shoot. Okay, I'll go. Uh, how about the keys to the car? Well, I thought we were going for a walk. Well, take a rain check. I'd like to drive into the city. I'll be my guest. 
<laughs> Just drive carefully. Don't worry. I'll be back for dinner. Can I give you a hand, Amelia? I don't think so, Stephen. My, this place is dusty. I'll empty the trash basket for you. Just dump things in the uh, plastic bag. Don't you feed Mike, Amelia? <laughs> I do. Look at all these hamburger wrappings. Well, I think he feeds his frogs with them. Oh, no. What's wrong, Stephen? You're as white as a sheet. Yeah. This piece of paper. Well, what is it? It's part of an envelope, Amelia. The one that contained the letter Sir Rubius wrote to us. <gasps> oh, my God. But why didn't I... Destroy the letter? That's what I'm wondering, too. And I don't like the answer I get. Hello. Yes, this is Dr. Stampler. He what? Can't be. We'll be right over. Yes, but I, I want to see my son. What is it, Stephen? <laughs> what? Stokes, I don't want to see him. I want to see my son. Hello. Hello. He hung up. What happened? Mike, they're looking for him. What for? They claim he's killed someone. I don't believe it. With the car? I mean, with an accident? There's no accident. They found Claire Baxter dead. What's that got to do with Mike? They claim he was seen near the place where the body was found. Oh, where's Mike now? He disappeared. They found our car in the ravine. Oh, no. I'll go see. Good evening. Yes, Reverend Stokes, what is it? Well, may I come in? No, you may not. Now clear out of here. Oh, what's wrong with you, Steve? Please come in, Reverend. Thank you, Mrs. Stampler. I know it's painful, but I must talk to you. What is there to talk about? Your son. I tried to reach you before with facts, but you wouldn't listen. Well, why should I of all these silly nonsense? No nonsense this time, I'm afraid. Your son has committed murder. Just because he was seen near where the girl was found, up at half the no town... No one else in there. town would kill the way Claire was slaughtered. Please, I don't want to hear any more. Can we just sit quietly and wait? For what? For your son to return. And then what? Then we'll... We'll do what must be done. You won't wait here. Now be sensible. There are men just beyond this door. I would prefer to do this as reasonably as possible. Do what? Just ask him a few questions, Mrs. Sampler. Now please let me handle this. Or would you prefer mob violence? Ask your questions, Stokes. Oh, I'm here. Run, Mike. Clear yourself. Not yet. I've got a score to settle with old Nosey. Sit down, Michael. It's all over for you. For you, meddler. No, Asmodeus. Your time has come. Asmodeus. Asmodeus, Satan, whatever you call yourself. Sit down and answer my questions. I've changed my mind. I'll answer your questions if you catch me. Stop him, Stephen. Please don't let him go. Oh, a minute. Don't worry. Stokes will never get him. Neither will that mob. He's on his way back. Back where? Well, we found him, Amelia. In the sacrificial chamber. Sir Rubia said someday Mike would return. Just a while longer, Amelia. I'm all right, Stephen. Do you think we'll find him? He wanted so badly to find his way back. He must be here. I'm glad he got away from the mob. I'm not so sure about that. I pieced together Sir Rubius's letter from the scraps in the wastebasket. It explains a great deal. Michael was not just an ordinary Indian child abandoned by his parents. The tribes have a legend about the pure-born son of kings who is sacrificed for his people. Do you think... Michael? I don't know, Amelia. I don't know what to believe anymore. There's, there's a light in the chamber ahead. I know. Hold this lantern, Amelia. Hold it high. Don't come any closer. Michael. Oh, thank God we found you. 
Where are you, Mike? Boy, we believe in you. We trust you. Stay where you are. Do as I tell you. We want to help you. Then leave. That's the best you can do for me. You kept me from my destiny when you took me from this tomb. Let me fulfill it now. We love you, Michael. Please save yourself. Hold the lantern higher, Amita. What is it? There's a child, Em. There's a baby on the altar where we found Mike. It's Michael. Oh, my God. It's Michael. It, it can't but be. He is, I remember, every detail. Stay back, stay, stay back, Amita. Don't come any closer. It's a child on the altar. It's Mike. Someone or something is standing over it. Oh, oh no, oh, no. I can't believe it. The child's off. Oh, God, no. My God. Oh, my God. It's too late, Amelia. It's all over now. Whoever it was has disappeared, Amelia. He's gone. A child is born, becomes a man, then dies. The natural order of things. No one can upset it. But not in the case of Michael Stampler, or whatever his true name was. He was plucked out of antiquity by accident and returned there by desire. I'll be back shortly. The dark closet was open for a short time, and instead of light streaming in, evil oozed out. An ancient magic spanned the bridge of time, and for a while, dark forces swirled once again, turning reason into fear, understanding into violence, and light into shadow. Our cast included Patricia Rowe, Ralph Bell, Don Scardino, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, he's a mad killer, you say, so he wanders around, and if he gets a chance, he'll kill. He sees a woman alone in a parking lot, Mrs. Denson. He shoots her. He sees Mrs. Drew in her backyard. He shoots her. He sees Mrs. Goodman alone in her apartment. He shoots her. Okay, how do you account for Mrs. Cannon? You're dealing with a madman, Lou. You can't account for anything he does. All right, three women are targets of opportunity. They happened along, or he happened along, and that was it. But he went out of his way to kill Mrs. Cannon. Look, he had to slug the night watchman. He had to take the elevator up 12 stories to find her. It means he wasn't just out to kill any woman. He wanted that woman. Why? That's good thinking, Lou. And if this were almost any other kind of case... Blake. What? Oh, no. Not another one. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.